working, everybody. Sorry, we're waiting for the clock to turn to 10, just in case loads of members of the public couldn't get in. Uh, very good morning to everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our panel for coming along, and I'll introduce you in a, in a short minute or two. Uh, first of all, we need to see if we have any apologies. Premier, we've received apologies for absence from Assemblymember Ashwani. Assemblymember Sahota is attending as a substitute. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, so our main discussion today is going to be on pedicabs, and that will be followed by our session on cycling infrastructure. Can I say to the, uh, the wider public who may be listening online, we would encourage everyone to uh, take part and you can also be involved using social media, hashtag pedicabs. There we are, we're in the 21st century. Could I also ask, actually I prefer to do it myself as well, uh, check that your phones are on silent, please, or any other mode that won't interrupt the meeting would be great. Thank you. So, then I ask members to let me know if they have any declarations of interest that aren't already notified to the authority. No? Okay. Minutes of the committee, do we agree those of the 8th of November? Agreed. Agreed. Marvellous, I'll sign those. Uh, and we're also asking to note the completed and outstanding actions arising from previous meetings of the committee. Thank you. Well, then we then come to the responses to our excellent bus report. And uh, there's a few recommendations here. First one is to note the responses from the Mayor and Transport for London <coughs> to the report, driven to distraction, making London's bus safer, and the summary of the response as set out in appendices one and two of the report. And to note the responses from the Mayor and Transport for London to the report, London's bus network, and the summary of the responses set out in appendices three and four. And I'm also going to add uh, C, and I'm asking for the committee to delegate authority to me in consultation with the deputy chair and the group leads to write to TfL requesting more information on their responses to our recommendations. Do we agree with that? Thank you very much. Door to door service update. The committee is recommended to note the update from Transport London on, res on the progress implementation and recommendations of the committee's report door-to-door -door transport in London, delivering a user-led service. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we come to the interesting part of the committee, which is our good friends opposite. So can I start, please, by introducing the panel and thanking you all for turning up today. First of all, Sean Conroy, who's Senior Policing and Partnership Manager, TfL. Morning. Kevin Goad, Head of Highways and Public Realm Westminster City. Morning. Ross Morgan, Chief Executive Heart of London Business Alliance. Morning. Chris Small, Spokesperson of the London Pedicab Operators Association. Good morning. And finally and not least, of course, Michael Fay, Pedicab Driver. Thank you for coming along. Thank you all for sparing your time. So, what we need to do now is we need to Ask a few questions, I suppose. So if I, I'll kick off, if that's all right. So this is to all members, so please feel free to answer. Perhaps we start with you, Sean, and work our way around, if that's okay. Um, what do pedicabs add to London's transport options? How many pedicabs are currently operating in London, and are the numbers increasing? Sean, do you want to kick off? Okay, um, I'll start with the numbers. So um, the reports I received are around about 400 in uh, the West End, um, but I believe that's probably under-reporting the numbers because the report's about 18 months old. So our belief is that they are there's more than 400 operating in that area. Um, what do they bring? Uh, I guess they're a transport option of choice. I mean, we there was a uh, study done which uh, looked at why people use them and people use them for fun um, as a different. Uh, transport choice that's that's not already out there so I, I'm inclined to believe that it's it's another choice of transport that people can use thank you sorry uh, could I ask you to turn the volume up a little bit I'm a bit mutton I'm afraid <coughs> yeah thank you Kevin uh, not much to add really uh, Chairman I mean the 400 pedicabs generally operate around Oxford Street Bond Street Regent Street Leicester Square 
Covent Garden and the Strand. Sorry, I'll, I'll speak up a bit, sorry. No, uh, it's, it's not you, it's them. <laughs> so just, just to recap, the 400 is the number that we, we, we work to, um, focused around Oxford Street, Regent Street, Bond Street, the orb area as we call it, Covent Garden, the Strand, Leicester Square, that's the principal area of, of opera operation. What do they bring? Potentially a sustainable transport option, colour, vibrancy, um, you know, it, it, pedicabs operate very successfully in many other cities across mm. the world. Ross? I think we've covered the numbers. Um, the numbers that we're working from at the minute is roughly 1,400, um, but there's no doubt that those numbers are increasing um, day by day. In terms of um, what pedicabs add to the landscape, um, I'm sure Michael and Chris might be able to better answer this, but in, in my opinion, it has the potential um, to offer a minor novelty tourist attraction to the area, um, but not in its current format. It's doing the complete opposite opposite of that right now. Um, you know, the lack of regulation means that pedicabs are damaging our international reputation. Um, but if it was regulated and managed in a, um, a more efficient way, I think that it has the potential to offer this minor attraction to tourists in the area. Chris, here we go. Um, I, I'd agree with most of what Ros says. I think that it, it's, it's a, a, a transport option for short journeys, generally around the West End. Um, there, there, there are, I think you said 1,400, Ros. I think it's more like sort of three to 400. I don't think it's, it's not quite 1,400 now. Um, and it, it, it's been going since 1998. It's very safe, actually. There's been, as far as we're aware, well, there's certainly been no fatalities or serious injuries, and that the information has come from TfL, TfL's collision reports. So, of course, there have been collisions, but there's been very few major ones, and generally they're the fault of uh, the traffic, so other traffic. So, um, <coughs> it's, it, yes, it does add... add colour and vibrancy to the to the streetscape and it is another option but I agree wholeheartedly with Roz that it needs to be controlled in some way or other. Michael. Yeah. Um, to, 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 to add to that I have also worked abroad in Europe okay. where, where there is, there is a light regulation for example in Germany um, and there it seems to work very well depending on the city and where you work. Some of them have demarcated areas where the pedicabs can um, sit and wait for customers. There's even one in Munich in front of the town hall, for example. Um, uh, to, to, to over in Berlin, where it's uh, even more lightly regulated, and there it's just kind of commonly agreed areas where the, the, the pedicabs can sit and wait. And whenever there's, if there's a problem, you know, the, the police talk to a couple of the companies, and then it's spread through social media. And that generally, people then stick to the to the uh, commonly agreed rules. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, thank you. Rob. Um, Keith, I think one of the obvious statements to make there are four is that we don't know the exact numbers, and that's part of the problem. There is no formal way of knowing what these numbers are, which is one of the, the, the asks that we've been making to to the mayor and to Parliament as well. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question is Caroline. Okay, I want to talk about passenger safety because that's uh, clearly a huge concern and it's something we've consistently picked up through work, for example, we've done on taxi and private hire. Um, how safe is it to travel in a pedicab in London? Who would like to go first? Chris and then Michael. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the record is that they are extremely safe. I mean, TfL's own, uh, we, I, I was hoping to get another FOI by today, actually, but didn't quite make it. But um, the, the last, uh, the, the reports I've had over the last 10 years have, have been that, that actually they are very safe. Um, but of course, that, that they're, they, they need to be properly designed. They need to be specifically designed for, um, for carrying passengers. There's, there are a lot of safety aspects that were, were studied in great detail in, in the um, TfL uh, consultation on licensing pedicabs, which was in 2006. Um, and uh, in th this, was, this was carried out by an engineer, um, and he, he was quite happy with the, with the specifications set out. I, might, I must add that a lot of the pedicabs around do not comply with any of those, yeah. um, those uh, 
criteria that were set out. Um, and it included things like handholds for the passengers, dual braking systems, um, uh, passengers facing forward. You know, there were a number of things which I won't go through in detail now. Um, and the, the, now the, the, the regulations have changed, so you can also have electric assist pedicabs, which I think make them safer because they're faster off the, off the, uh, off the mark. Um, and they can keep up with the traffic a little bit better than perhaps some can, particularly where there's hills. So th the regulations have changed, so there can be an EA, what's called an EAPC now. Um, but uh, the, 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 you know, a properly constructed pedicab sh sh should be perfectly safe. There's many tens of thousands running in the States. As, as Michael said, they're running all over Europe. Um, and, and, and traffic is generally fairly slow moving in central London anyway. You're saying they're extremely safe. You're talking about the, the, the vehicle itself, the pedicab itself, and its yeah. roadworthiness, and if it's Correct. in... Yeah, I mean... It you're not talking about the in necessarily the individual <coughs> drivers, cyclists. That's, that's another aspect. That's another drivers aspect. Drivers should, should, should certainly have some training. Um, you know, it, 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 again, we, we worked this out with um, TfL that's at the much. time. Uh, the National Cycling Standard Level 3 was a minimum standard that the riders had to uh, achieve with, a, with, a, with a, 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 competence, a competencies module on pedicabs or indeed work bikes because of course you've got a lot of work bikes mm. now in London. Mm. Um, so the CTC, Cycle Touring uh, mm. Organisation, we, we did a lot of work with them um, and we, we produced a full training course uh, for pedicab and, and work bike riders. Um, and uh, so that's still, that is still there. And in the company that I used to, I no longer run the company now, but all, all our riders had to go through both those training, training uh, uh, elements. Mm. Michael, do you want to come in as a, do we call you a driver or a cyclist? I'm not sure what term you prefer no, to be used. Well, uh, officially, uh, under legal terms, you'd be a cyclist because a driver has a motorised vehicle. Yes, okay. So, so that's to make that clear. Um, and then, uh, so as you say, in, in Europe, there are, it has been for many, many years now accepted that the, the bicycles can have electric assist. So that includes also the rickshaws, and they've been operating without problems with electric assist well before anywhere in the UK was, because that was one of the last European countries to mm. accept or change the rules. That was only happened maybe two, three years ago. Um, so the UK is in many respects catching up to the rest of the world as far as cycling regulation laws and everything else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But how safe do you think pedicabs are? Extremely safe. I, I've always said they're safer than flying. Because I did, um, I'm working on the look up the figures, and I saw there was 6,000 or so pedestrians every year getting killed or injured on the streets. Um, you know, there was 50,000 or so people dying from pollution, from <laughs> and a lot of that can be attributed to, uh, you know, cabs on the street, which aren't electric assist, or, you know, they're still pushing out diesel. And in many countries, uh, sorry, in many cities in Europe, the diesel has not been banned in the cities. Um, so it's particularly in, in Berlin, for example. And that, so, London, safety, so, so London yeah. is, in that respect, has got a bit of catching up to do. Okay, okay. TfL, do you want to uh, Yeah, absolutely. Comment? I think the safety thing for us is the biggest concern. And, and with no regulation, there's no standard. So certainly what, what um, the, as Kevin said earlier, the officers from the orb team um, are coming across. Is, uh, there are some very good operators, but they're also there's no standard, so it's a bit of a mixed bag what they're coming across. And I think, as colleagues on the panel were saying, I think with regulation you can then set a safety standard, and then you can guarantee what what the safety standard the pedicabs are going to come across will be. We're going to come on to in detail regulation yeah, yeah. later in our questioning, but as it is at the moment, um, obviously Chris and Mike have said it's very safe. Um, whether the, the fleet, as it were, are safe, but actually, you know, I've, I've seen pedicab cyclists, you know, racing each other on the wrong side of the street down Regent Street mm -hmm. late at night when I was out on a taxi touting um, visit. You know, I, I've seen it with my own eyes, and that's, that's not safe, is it, for Londoners, surely? No, not at all. Um, I, I think there, there are... There are piece of legislation in place to deal with the antisocial behaviour part, albeit not perfect, 
But if, if we're talking about safety of vehicles, which, which I think the original question was, was because there's no standard, we can't be sure what we're going to come across. And I think with a standard, then I think it'll be a much better, safer option for the potential passengers. What, what safety features would you want, what specification would you like for a, a, a new pedicab if it was to be uh, safe and, and would be licensed? Um, I couldn't say at this stage. I, I don't know enough about the build of a pedicab to be able to say what we'd like to see. I, I think the consultation that was referenced earlier might go some way towards it, but I think we probably have to look and, and if, if regulation was going to come into place, it would be part of the consultation, I think, that would be need to be kind of put out to the public. Chris, do you want to answer what you started a bit earlier? What specifications would make pedicab safer? Yes, I mean, I'd also quite just like to qualify what I said. I mean, the, 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 the safety of a pedicab is, is down to the rider and down to the pedicab. So, you know, in my experience, we, we, you know, I ran a, a pedicab business for 15 years. We never had a serious accident because the riders were trained and because the, the bikes were fit for purpose. Mm. <coughs> um, so, it, it, yes, I mean, obviously, they've got to be specifically designed for carrying passengers. They need a safety belt. Um, they need a full lighting system. They need indicators, brake lights. Um, as I said earlier, handholds. There's, there's a bar that goes behind the passenger, uh, sorry, behind the rider. The rider always at the front. Um, and obviously wheels that are that are, that are, sp are strong enough to, to 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 carry the sort of weight that mm -hmm. a pedicab will um, carry. Uh, maximum of three passengers um, sit, must be seated at all times. Um, so, it, it, as 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 I said, that this was really well worked out. And in fact, I have talked to B BSI, who put a proposal together, which we put to both TFL and the DFT to say, look, BSI would be happy to, to set a standard right. um, for a pedicab. Um, and, uh, in, in, and obviously B, B, BSI would be a good, a good company, a good organisation to do it. We, we actually got a minister's approval certificate for uh, an electric assist pedicab because they wouldn't do an approval certificate for a non-motorised one. So as, as, as an exercise, we did that, and it passed with flying colours. So if, if, if uh, that's a, the, the, it would be in the DVLA, I think. Uh, but anyway, wh whoever, whoever does the vehicle standards, we've got a minister's approval certificate for it. And, uh, and they, they were pretty rigorous, and they looked at all the seat, seat belt mountings and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the pedicab has to be fit for purpose and specifically designed, and, ma and of course maintained. So it is possible to have that sort of standard brought in that could be universally adopted? I, I, I think for sure. I mean, you know, dual braking systems, so a, an independent braking system on the front and the back. So, you know, the, 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 the various other, other small aspects to the design that, that, that essentially, if it's ridden properly, in the same way as a car, if a car's ri driven properly, it's pretty safe. Mm. Okay. Maybe I could bring in perhaps Westminster about the issue of driver conduct and also the fact that they don't have um, DMB checks done, these drivers, which is, I think, goes back to Ros's reputational risk for London as well. And what does Westminster want to see around, um, if, uh, around drivers and what checks and so on should be in place? I think I'm um, just building on... Uh, it, it, it is a vehicle carrying people. It needs to be safe. It needs to be regulated. It needs to be annually inspected, MOT, if you want, if you want a better way of describing it. The same check should apply to the individuals operating these devices or, the, or, or, or pedicabs. Uh, you don't appoint a door supervisor anymore to stand guard on a pub or a club. They have to be regulated. They have to be checked. They have to be of, uh, competent individuals with sound backgrounds. And I think. You know, by imposing those sorts of um, requirements, then you will drive out or drive away uh, those uh, riders who perhaps aren't behaving in a way that is a conducive to um, you know de common decency, but more importantly, it's giving the pedicab industry a, a bad name. So I think you have to apply those checks uh, to the physical uh, device itself, to the individuals, and the appropriate training. <coughs> Extending that. You also have to consider the suitability of London's roads 
and where these, the, the, these pedicabs should operate. Um, in, you know, pedicabs in Westminster often ride down pedestrianised roads. Mm. It's not appropriate. Okay. In fairness, pedicab riders, cyclists ride, ride down um, um, uh, pedestrian roads. So there's got to be an accepted code of practice that's signed up to by any local authority uh, and the pedicab industry that says we will not tolerate this sort of behaviour from our own uh, riders uh, um, and members of, of, of anybody that's set up. So, you know, this is something that we, we, can, we can manage, something that we can actually um, support in the right way, but we have to go through a process of recognising the suitability of the device, the suitability of the, of the rider, the appropriateness of where you, um, where you uh, do your business, before we get on to the consumer side, which I'm sure you'll come to later in terms of your questioning. Um, Ross, did you want to comment on this yes. at all? <clears throat> so in answer to the question, are they safe? Who knows? Um, but I don't believe in self-assessment, <coughs> especially whenever you're taking other people's lives into your, your hands. So for me, our concern um, as a coalition is that you know, the danger, the danger of these vehicles and, and the danger that they can present, not just to the passengers, to the pedestrians and road users, but to the drivers themselves. Um, London is like nowhere else, um, so I don't think we really can compare in terms of whether it's safe or not to cycle with pedestrians. I think we just need to look at the facts and the figures that we've got in front of us. Um, in terms of, I've got a serious concern in terms of no um, DBS checks, mm. I cer certainly wouldn't be riding on any pedicab mm. um, without that. And then obviously you've got this um, conduct and behaviour and I do support voluntary codes of conduct and I've been involved in them for all sorts of other um, initiatives and industries. Um, but they only work if everybody follows that code and unfortunately there are plenty of people willing to, to, to go against any code of conduct. So even if we did have a code of conduct for the majority, um, I believe that they, you know, there's still a need for management and enforcement and who, who is it that can be held to account if we don't have a record um, and we don't have rules or standards um, to follow. Um, and the powers available to our police, to the council, is weak. Um, and without proper, a proper licensing regime, um, the worst, most dangerous repeat offenders can't be banned from operating. Yeah. Did anyone else want to add anything on this issue of safety from either the passenger, the cyclist, or the, the uh, pedicab itself? No? Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got um, a few people have indicated. <coughs> so I've got uh, Navin, Carl, and Russell, and uh, Joanne. So I'm going to ask. What's uh, order, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, my, uh, my, my starting question is to Chris uh, and uh, others who may want to come in, and that's uh, about a uh, training course that uh, you mentioned. First uh, question is, is it mandatory? It, n unfortunately, nothing's mandatory at the moment. Um, but we, we, when, when uh, uh, I, I was running a company and that, there was a successor who took over, um, no rider could register with us without passing both the National Cycling Standard Level 3 and the pedicab uh, module. And they also had to provide IT, ID and all that sort of stuff. Um, so no, it's not mandatory, but we, we had uh, two, two of our staff train up as instructors. So they were qualified by the CTC to do the training course and, and to issue the certificate at the end of it. It, it was all we could do, and, that, and that's, all that, that, that's all that is currently available as well. But it was a very effective training course, and ob obviously we, we, we had uh, what we called rider support out every night, so we also had some monitoring on the streets, and, and, and if, if someone behaved badly, and I, I completely understand what you said, Ross, you know, the, 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 prob the problem is at the moment there's nothing to lose at all. So there's no regulations, there's no... Uh, that there's not, that there, is, there is some enforcement, but essentially, um, uh, that no one's got anything to lose. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the problem. Do you have uh, any figures in terms of how many of the drivers uh, cur are currently sort of uh, trained drivers who have gone through the course uh, of the numbers you have? Okay, I, I, I can't answer that, but I might be able to get the answer for I, 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 I've, I've been, I've been, I'm not an executive uh, member of the LPOA. Essentially, they've asked me to be their spokesman because, of course, I've been through this 
through, through the entire If you process. can, uh, both yes. uh, confirm the total numbers of... Uh, sure. Uh, well, so as far as I'm aware, there's the around... Drivers you have uh, yeah. and how many are actually... Yeah, as far as I'm aware, there's around yeah. 200 within companies within the LPOA. Yeah. What I can't tell you is how many of those have been trained uh, to this National Stat Cycling Standard Level 3. I think, again, the problem is that uh, if, if it's not a requirement, which it should be, um, then, you know, people will probably not go through that expense. And so, you know, and, and as I'm sure has, has come across, you know, I've been campaigning Well, to what get is us. the cost? Well, it, 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 there's obviously a cost in running a training course, in having, having a trained instructor, um, and it's, it, it, it's, it's the time involved, you know, if everything has a cost, but it, it, it's, it's a, t a totally necessary cost, I've always thought. And it, and it, was, it, it, it was a very successful programme. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm sure we'll come along to, uh, later on to the regulation stuff, but there, there has been an absolutely enormous amount of work done on this, and I'm sorry to say that absolutely none of it has been taken up. And I had a recent uh, uh, thing with the Transport uh, Committee at the GLA, actually, um, and uh, Val Shawcross came back to me, but, you know, th 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 there's... Th you know, I'm probably going off a bit your question a little bit, no. but but essentially um, everyone's washed their hands of it and put it in the hands of the DFT, but the DFT have done nothing for five years. That's well, the problem. Well, something else? needs to happen Pardon? quickly. Something needs to happen quickly. Uh, absolutely, on this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and 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 perhaps when we get on to the, onto that, I can I can mm. at least sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks. Uh, on uh, well on on. Two, three occasions, and it's good to hear that uh, you, you said that uh, pedicabs are very safe. There have only been some minor incidents, though looking at some of the incidents uh, in the report that you have, it is actually worrying that both uh, in terms of uh, uh, safety of vehicles as well as passengers for, from various incidents, they, they are of serious nature. <coughs> don't know how, how many of them there are, they are and that, that's where uh, my next question is. And that is that, uh, do you actually have an annual record or, or some recording and monitoring system of safety incidents, both of uh, vehicles as well as uh, personal injuries? And in, what do you do about them? In, in, the, in the company I ran, which I haven't run for uh, over five years now, oh, we, of course we had it, we kept records of it. And uh, the, 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 there were very few personal injuries, if any. I think one small one, a broken arm, I believe. So it's, it's it, and, and of course TfL also holds this data, so, um, and I'm sorry I don't have the right up to date data, but um, the, 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 I can't remember the precise report, but the, there's, the, most of the incidents were minor, and most of those were co actually caused by other vehicles. W would you be able to send uh, to the committee yeah, when I get some, that, yeah, some information sure. about, you know, when you say, what the minor incidents are, what sure. do they actually entail, and then what level of breakdown of vehicles that happen as well, which could lead to serious or, or more uh, incidents uh, or Absolutely, accidents. Absolutely, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure you'll... Yeah. yeah, sorry, just to step in, I've, I've got so it's 10 years' worth of data from two, to 2005 to 2015. There was 58 collisions, if we're talking principally about collisions, which I think you might be, of which three were, um, sorry, six were classed as serious in 2015 or last year. So it's the last year, apologies for being a couple of years out of date, but I will actually send the committee the last two years worth of data. In 2015, there were just three slights and no serious. So in terms of numbers, it's low, but I, I guess you have to then think about proportions of, of pedicaps in comparison yeah. to other, other vehicles. But yeah, in terms of serious ones. Ross, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I think um, we need to be careful um, not just to look at reported incidences. Mm, mm, um, yes. I think, you know, my concern is actually the unreported incidences, which sometimes I assume could be much more serious. Um, and, you know, we've recent news and conversations has demonstrated that that's not necessarily an assumption, but for a likelihood. Um, and definitely um, <coughs> from the... The, the camera footage and the video footage that we've taken and um, some of the conversations that we have had 
over the years, serious assaults are likely to have happened, um, but are likely to have gone unreported. And I think that, for me, is of more concern to some extent. Uh, I think with the minor incidences and the, the vehicle um, impacts and things like that, I think we can, we can look at that and we can come up with the standards and we can fix that. Um, my concern is how do we monitor, how do we know the numbers, how, how do we know who these drivers are, you know, have they been CRB checked, um, and should there be any misconduct of, um, of, of the serious kind, how do we ban them, and, and as Chris has said, there is nothing to lose right now, there is nothing to stop that person or those individuals continuing to go out, um, you know, um, assaulting potentially individuals and continuing to do that on a daily basis. We don't know. We don't have the facts. There's no way of recording it currently. Yeah, th thank you. That's a uh, very, very useful, critical information uh, uh, we, we have uh, from you. Uh, Sean, if I can move uh, on to you. Uh, in 2005, uh, my notes say here, the Transport Committee recommended that the Met Police should improve the information it collects on cab-related crime to ensure greater understanding of whether offences are committed by licensed taxis, private highway vehicles, and pedicabs. Mm -hmm. Where are we on that 12 years on? Do you know? Are so you able to tell Details of offences? Yeah, criminal offences. Yeah, so I know that the, the ORB team, so that's a, a team that sits within the uh, Westminster Borough Police, uh, do collect and, and do disseminate the figures out. And I understand the Deputy Mayor went out with them, I think it was last year. Um, I, I don't have the figures to hand. Um, but they certainly do collect them. But of course, that's so a lot of the legislation they use is around the antisocial behaviour um, aspect, and uh, it's, it's about issuing uh, community protection notices and things like that, which actually take, in terms of building up evidence, quite a long time. So it starts with a, starts with a verbal warning, then a written warning. So it's, you know, they, they have collated this, but I suspect that the final numbers in terms of who, individuals that have been issued with a community protection notice will be quite low in comparison to the initial um, conversation between a police officer and and a pedicab rider. So I mean I can get figures from the last few operations um, and they do collect them uh, but I don't, I don't have them to hand. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I, yes. sorry, can I just oh. add, I mean I, I did some digging last night before the committee and in, in between January 16 and January 17 there were 47 CPN warnings given to pedicab drivers in the Orb area, mm. which resulted in seven CPNs being formally issued. So th the evidence gathering process is a very time consuming and resource intensive process. And often the issues that are being faced in terms of reported incidents, when you arrive, there's no one to talk to. Mm. Mm. Amplified noise is a, is a particular issue for Westminster and its residents. If you're blaring a stereo out of the back of a, a, a pedicab, which does happen, yeah. you have to have someone reporting it formally to impose an EPA noise notice. The pedicab driver will have disappeared. A dispersal notice lasts 48 hours. It takes time to process a dispersal notice. Control of pollution act, after 9 p.m., no noise. Come back tomorrow. So all these things, the powers to enforce the behaviours that we don't want to see on the streets aren't there. If you don't have an MOT, if you don't license your vehicle, it's a massive fine or a custodial sentence. Thank you. Um, Carl, sorry? Oh, sorry. Could I could just, just add to that? I, I, I mean, I think one, you know, the, 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 I, I accept that there are an enormous amount of problems. But the problems really stem from, uh, partly from the difficulties for the police. We've done a lot of work with the Met Police on this over the years. That, and, and, and have indeed worked very well with them in the past. And essentially, the problem they have is that there is one of identification. They, they, mm. they cannot identify the vehicles and they cannot yes. identify the riders. Um, and, of, uh, and, and, and the, the, the third thing, you know, if, if, if we're being relatively simplistic at this stage about it, is that there, are, there is no rank space. So the, 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 the pedicabs uh, do um, congregate sometimes at, at inappropriate places. Now, this was recognised very clearly by Martin Lowe, um, 
previous predecessor at uh, okay, Westminster. We're, we're going to come on to uh, okay, parking right. and ranking. Uh, okay, I'll just. I, 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 so, with, with regard to disorderly behaviour, yeah. which was was uh, um, the police have a, have a real problem with this, and sure. and, and, and uh, so that's that's definitely something that needs to be resolved. Thank you, Michael. I'd just like to say, it, uh, at this stage, it's very very important to deal with the facts that we do have rather than conjecture or propaganda, because the industry has been subject to a lot of propaganda or fear mm. tactics, and there's been many things like, uh, let's say, unfair harassment by s certain authorities, maybe because there are a few riders who are, you know, have a, a tarnishing the, the, the industry for the rest of us, but most of the people out there are, you know, good guys and they want to yeah, and good girls as well, the women do it as well. Um, and they want to, yeah, you, know, um, you know, provide a good service and uh, they, they do it because it's fun. But yeah, there's, there's very few um, that should be, uh, and that's the reason why there should be some regulation. And in other places where I've worked, you know, they, uh, we're, we're going to come back to the, the ranks later, but that is a place where the, the bikes or the pedicabs can congregate, and therefore in those areas they'd be easier to control the spot checks. Sure. So that way it benefits both both people. Okay. You know, the better cabs get a space and then the, the council or the police then have a, a very clear space or area where they know the bikes are going to be. It makes it easier for everybody. Okay, we're, we're going to come on to parking yeah. and uh, regulation a bit, bit later, but thank you, it's helpful. Uh, I've got Caroline Russell. Yeah. Yes, bringing us back to safety. Um, I understand that there are a few quite big pedicab companies who rent out pedicabs to riders or drivers um, for about £100 a week. Is, is that correct? Approximately. R approximately. So what I'm wondering is, if there are safety issues in this particular business model, now obviously we're hearing from everyone very strongly that regulation is the solution. We're coming on to regulation later. Um, and it's really good to see everyone across the panel from all the positions um, thinking that that, that is a, a positive solution. Um, but I'm just wondering if this business model um, provides um, issues in terms of driver well-being and, um, and, and, and also their safety. Because if these bikes are being rented out, who does the maintenance? Is it the person riding the bike or is it the company that rents out the bike? In, 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 in our case, we employed two full-time qualified mechanics and their job was to do a, a, a full service, I think it was every week or 10 days or something like that. Um, and they were always on hand when the bikes went out, so if there were any problems, they were there to fix them. But more importantly than that, the riders had to sign, had, to, had a, a check sheet. So they had, the, and they, they had to go through a number of checks, all, you know, the key checks for the, for the vehicle, and they had to sign that they'd done those checks. And I can say that there was some resistance to that initially, but actually it, it, it became, became absolute practice because the last thing they wanted to find is a puncture when they were out there or you know, some, something has gone wrong with the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So actually we almost never had to, rec to, to get a vehicle back it was because, because they were well maintained firstly and secondly because the rider took the responsibility to check the bike before they went out and signed for it. So that's obviously a, a company that is taking safety seriously. Sure. Are there some companies that are just renting out bikes without, without providing that service? Without a doubt. So for those, that's an, so that is a safety risk that um, that would be fixed by regulation. Yeah. Um, then what about um, for the riders? And Michael, maybe you'd like to come in on this. If you're needing to pay the rent on your pedicab for the week, how many hours typically are you working and do you think that that has an impact on your safety and well-being? Um, it really depends on the, of the season of the year. Obviously in the summer, when it's busy, you go out and work more hours, maybe five <laughs> days a week typically. In the winter, it might be two or three days per week. Um, but yeah, mostly say weekends. Um, and would it impact the, the rider safety? I think generally most riders are self uh, responsible for themselves. You know, they have to take care of their bikes because if the bike isn't in good condition, they obviously, it's a tool. Mm. So if the, the tool isn't working, they can't earn money. 
So the last, the biggest complaint of any rider, you know, especially if they're working for a company, is, hey, boss or whatever, my, my bike's not working, can you get it fixed as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. You know, so it is in the interest of everybody to have a working bike in the, in the, yeah, or a tool. Um, and um, as far as working hours, I think, yeah, most people regulate their own working hours because, you know, if it's busy, you can work longer, eight, eight hours to a full day. If it's not so busy, maybe you do two or three and then you go home. So, yeah. But if you're paying a fixed cost to rent the bike each week, are you able <coughs> to earn enough money to pay the rent and keep food on the table? Again, it depends on the time of year. Again, it's a very seasonal based work in the summer. You've definitely got more chance of doing that. And there are some uh, riders who are more uh, customer friendly and uh, others who are not suited to the job at all. So the ones who are not able to do that generally leave. So there will be a turnover, a certain percent. Um, and then, yeah, certainly in the winter, it's more difficult to cover that rent. So you may, there's some weeks where maybe you're just working just to cover the rent and maybe you just have enough for yourself. <coughs> so there are weeks where, you know, you, you don't earn, uh, or months even, where you don't earn that much. So you have to do something else or take your savings from the good months, you know, like, like that. Thank you. David, you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question to, to Sean, actually. Um, <coughs> Are you aware of something that happened in September 2014 when the Metropolitan Police seized nine pedicabs because they'd been fitted with motors to make them go faster? Is that something that you uh, know about? I'd, I'd heard very briefly before, before coming here actually about the, the motors, which I think actually were dealt with and from what I understand very quickly removed from hmm. any other pedicabs that had had them. Yeah, that, that was three years ago. Yeah. Is there any ongoing checks or investigations to make sure that there's no further occurrence of that? Because obviously that's something that is incredibly dangerous if their pedicabs had been fitted with motors. And actually the owners of two of the pedicabs were fined £200 and seven of the others were summoned to court. So obviously that's something that's illegal. Um, what, what's anybody doing to make sure that that doesn't happen again? or that if it is happening that uh, people who are doing that at court and those pedicabs which have been fitted with motors, if there are any, uh, are immediately taken out of service? Well, it's, it's one of the things that the, the dedicated teams and your team would look out for, as would the sort of ordinary officers knowing that actually, I think with a motor, not an electric, but a motor would then, it changes the classification of the vehicle mm. and therefore they're subject to a lot of other things, which is what happened yeah. to these ones. So yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's almost part of a business as usual check that, that would happen if, if an officer comes across yeah. a vehicle they believe has a motor. Yeah, the issue would be with people pretending that they're still pedicabs when actually they are mm -hmm. motorised vehicles. So that's, that's something that's you know we want to make sure never happens. Y yes, Chris. Yeah. David, I wonder if I could just clarify that the, 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 um, a, a, a pedicab with a, with a motor fitted in 2014 was totally illegal because they, it wouldn't have fall under the what's called the electric electric assist ped, electric assisted pedicab regulations mm. um they were double illegal because they had motors on them that which were a, a, you know a kilowatt um and, and you could just twist and go mm. so they had to go and we we actually had it worked and, and had a campaign with the police police and westminster council on that because they were not n n n not acceptable at all. Mm. However, um, I think it was last year or the year before the the, the European, uh, the UK have changed the regulations to fit to, to harmonise with the European regulations. So now you can have what's called an electric assist pedicab, which ha which has a, a maximum uh, power output motor output of 250 watts, and it has to have a, what's called a pedalet control on it. So you have to be pedalling. And, it, and, 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 and so it's purely as, a, as an assist to start off mm. and as an assist sort of going up a hill. And it, actually, it, that, that I think does add to the safety. And that's not classed as a motor vehicle. That's still an electric, mm. electrically assisted pedicab. But, but c clearly, uh, uh, some people were, were, were decided that, oh, well, you, you can put any size of, of motor on it or whatever. So. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that, that as an EAPC, a proper EAPC, that, 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 that is, is in accordance with the regulations, that it, it, it is a very, very helpful thing and actually does, I think, enhance, um, uh, enhance a pedicab significantly, but not with a one kilo, okay. kilowatt. Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to make 
to okay, clarify yeah, that. Thank point. you. Thanks. Yeah, yes, Martha. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, yeah, I'd like to add. There was a couple of years ago as well. It was like the business consortium of electric uh, bike makers who've been uh, kind of um, lobbying the European Parliament for a change in the regulation because they see that to this 250 watt pedal assist or electric motor is kind of, um, it was this rule or regulation was set years ago, long before this electric pedal assist became popular. So they've been saying it should be, you know, 500. And in some countries, in Switzerland, in Austria, it's 350. In Finland, 1,000. In the US, 750. So every country has their own um, kind of recommendation or guideline as to what a, a pedal assisted bicycle is. Uh, but certainly for a, a pedicab carrying up to three people, could be uh, you know, a couple of hundred kilos, I'd say 250 watts could, should <laughs> be, um, there should be some kind of um, new uh, classification for rickshaws, maybe up to 500 watts. You know, there's, there, there are certain motors out there, manufacturers maybe you could speak to, who have built motors where the, there's a continuous, uh, like 250 watt power, but then when you, when you need it at starting off, it does go up to say 1,000 watts. Uh, there's a couple of manufacturers that do, that do do that, and they are um, in operation in many countries around Europe, so that could be a possibility for the future. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Lovely. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so moving on now to parking and congestion. I think we've covered some of it already, but anyway, sure. Um, morning. I'm going to address my first comments to, to, to Kevin, if, if you don't mind. Um, how can we tackle the problem of pedicabs blocking streets and pathways? Is, is it a problem? <laughs> um, I think it depends on the location and the activity. If you're in the West End in, in the summer, as Michael was saying, it's busy, there's potentially lots of customers. And if you're all queuing your bikes on one lane of Oxford Street or two lanes of Oxford Street, you're going to create problems. At the end of the day, it's police power to move these, the, 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 the bikes on. It's not a, not, not a local authority power. We can ask, we can encourage, we can support. But if you're blocking the public highway, um, we can take some power. But actually, if you turn up, what is a, what is a driver rider going to do? They're going to ride off. So all you do by turning up is displace the problem. What you need is the powers to issue fines, as you do with a parking offence. Uh, and we don't do it anymore, but even immobilise the vehicle and, and permanently remove it from the street if it's a persistent offender. So our powers are limited. Um, you know, vehicles tend not, the, the, uh, cars are parked, there's no driver in them, you can remove them if you choose to. A pedicab will ride off if they're behaving inappropriately, and, that, and that's the challenge. Um, On-the-spot fines will be uh, one way of dealing with it. Um, you know, providing facilities, curbside space permitting, where pedicabs could actually rank in approved areas would be one way of doing it, dealing with it. But again, you're talking the competing requirements for curbside, residents, businesses, servicing, taxis, 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 taxis. Um, it's, it's a difficult balancing act. And then I think until we have a, a, a regulated approach to, to the pedicab um, services, I think the debate about where they can rank and not rank is actually academic because at the end of the day, if you are, if you are you know, applying for, your, for business, you're going to go where the business actually is. Michael, the same question to you. What do you think could be done to, to help with this um, problem of pedicabs blocking public highway? Um, yeah, providing safe spaces for them to congregate because at the moment, the only possible way is to, we're, we're, we're officially, they're, we're told to keep riding, riding, riding. You know, and for eight hours a day, that's pretty much impossible. At some point, you've got to stop for a drink, a coffee, go to the toilet, you know. And I think in, the, in previous years, um, there's been ca many, many cases where riders can't do that. They'd be harassed, you know, they start <laughs> um, uh, told to move on or issued fines or for, for many, you know, silly, silly things. And it's... Um, yeah, but it, and that could all be avoided and save a lot of paperwork and hassle for everybody if they simply had uh, a safe space. And that can either be um, through mutual agreement and, that, and save money, or um, another option would be you know, if there's any kind of fees involved in this licensing fee, that could be perhaps used to pay for these spaces so as, so as part of the, any kind of agreement. Um, that allows the right event to use these spaces in the city, so it's kind of pays for itself. Okay. 
Ross, uh, earlier on, you, you made a comment that you see Haley Camps as a, as a sort of tourist attraction and not a serious um, part of our travel infrastructure. But does that, is there particular places you think they, they would be less intrusive, more useful as a tourist product? Is there somewhere you'd like to see them? Scotland. <laughs> I'm joking. Sorry, sorry, Michael. Um, I, I just think we just need we need to be sensible. Um, there is no doubt about it. Uh, you just w walk into any busy street with lots of visitors, uh, especially theatres and uh, casinos. Especially, you know, we've got examples of the Hippodrome where we have major problems there. Lots of people coming and going through Leicester Square, um, and. Of course, that's where the pedicabs then arrive in groups, and it's blocking the streets, it's, it's blocking the highway for, for the public to get through, and it's also um, blocking the route for our taxis to get through and our delivery vehicles to get through. So I, I believe that they are incredibly disruptive on a day-to-day -day basis um, because they don't have any regulation and there isn't anywhere for them maybe to officially and formally park. So, I, I would call them a novelty vehicle, um, and, I, and I think that not only are they causing disruption and blockage, but they also have an impact on pollution. So while they're blocking the area, it's causing <coughs> other vehicle traffic to, to slow down or become idle, which has, has an impact, and we already know that that has an impact, um, especially in the West End. Um, in, in my opinion, I think uh, pedicabs should be uh, subject to the same parking and waiting restrictions as private hire vehicles. But, but that, that, that might be right, but there's a whole, a whole different thing there because the regulation will come on come to later. This is a wider question to everyone. What, at what part of any, any of your planning are pedicabs included? Because if they are a novelty, some people do like them. We're pedestrianising not Oxford Street. In a largely pedestrianised area, they may be more, uh, offer more access than a motorised cab, for instance. Mm. Has that factored into any planning that's going forward around Oxford Street in particular? I think all of those things have been taken into consideration for Oxford Street. Um, if I look at the area that I cover, that includes Piccadilly and um, Leicester Square. Mm -hmm. So if you use that as an example, definitely Leicester Square in reality is quite small, relatively speaking, it's small. So in an area like that, I don't believe that there would be a suitable space. Um, but I do know as part of the Oxford Street plans, there's lots of discussion and conversation about if and, and where um, these um, cycles might be parked. But there's one thing that the majority of people are agreeing on, that they shouldn't be allowed onto pavements. Um, pavements should be for pedestrians. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But I think the point I'm edging to, in, in, in a, from an environmental point of view, from an access point of view, this last 250 metres, not even last mile, they may be a way of, of, of replacing motorised cabs, which come with all kinds of different um, um, problems all of their own, of course, if, if they were regulated. And again, we'll, we'll come on to that. But at this point, and, and I'd like to include TfL in this, and Chris as well, who, who administers the, the, the regulation there is? I know that pedicabs are not regulated, but as a council, for instance, or as TfL, there seems to be a suite of things that are done. Would it be useful if there was one set of people who looked after mainly what goes on with pedicabs? You were saying you can't move them on. You're in charge of, of the road infrastructure. It just seems to me that... The, Half of the chaos of the pedicabs is chaos with the regulation. Nobody is in charge of all of it. I don't think that's right. I think you have powers as a local authority to manage your highways, highways obstructions and such like. But if a cyclist or a pedicab a rider moves on, what can you do about it? And, and Michael's right. But the, the cycling round is, is not practical. Um, is it for an individual local authority to control the regulation of, of a fair paying um, means of transport, which in the case of pedicabs it is. I don't think it is. I think TfL as a broader authority license and regulate private and black cab hire. Mm. Outside of London, pedicabs are regulated. So why are we still having the conversation 10 years later? And it's no criticism of GLA or TfL or local authorities. You know, we saw the minister two weeks ago. It's been kicked into a committee for a discussion. There needs to be some traction on this for, I think, for local authorities, for businesses, and more importantly, for the pedicab uh, industry and, 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 and those riders who actually are trying to uh, earn an honest living by doing the right things. And I think, you know, it's not the regulation, it's the, it's, it's the lack of regulation on a London-wide basis for this type of transport. It works, as Michael was saying, in Europe, it works in South America, 
why not in London? So you you again come on to regulate, but you're really saying we need to regulate the safety of the bikes it's and also the riders as well. So you we you wouldn't get into a black cab with a driver that hasn't been trained, hasn't got a license, hasn't got a vehicle that's che checked every year and isn't uh, charging an agreed rate of fare for one, two, three, or four passengers. Okay. Yeah, can I can I just say that we are going to come on to regulation <laughs> next if we stick to. Uh, Parking and congestion at the moment, please. My, my, uh, uh, so a slightly different um, angle again, uh, Director at TfL. Do you have any um, data for the impact of pedicabs on, on congestion? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we rely quite a lot, quite often on uh, driver incident reports. That's effectively where a bus driver is identifying uh, issues that they're coming across. Um, and principally, the issues, unsurprisingly, around Regent Street, Shaftesbury Avenue, um, Oxford Street, and uh, Westminster Bridge, uh, and fundamentally. Interestingly, though, between 2010 and 2013, we had 89 incidents of uh, a bus driver reporting this, but it's dropped hugely in the last two years, and that's not because there's less of them. I think actually what's happening, speaking to colleagues in buses, is that actually bus drivers are just expecting them to be there, expecting them to be in bus stops. So as much as there's a problem with vehicles being on the pavement, of which there's a very old piece of, of legislation that the, the police can use and disperse when identification of, of problems there, we regularly see them in bus stops and actually not dispersing. I'm not saying at all, but then what you have is an issue with people getting on and off buses being kind of almost having to do it within the carriage route because you've got pedicabs in the bus stop, which quite often with bus stops are situations where no one else will park in them, so it's, it's quite a handy place for them to be, and they're always in good location. So that's a common occurrence that bus drivers are facing, and as a result, our passengers on, on buses are facing as well. So if it's a congestion point of view, we, we, we suffer both from parking and also just from uh, bus drivers saying that they are holding them up as well. But as I said, reports are dropping off because it's almost expected in certain areas. Just one last question to wrap up. Did you say you had a dedicated team that looks at the issues around pedicabs? Oh, I got that wrong. Yeah, there, there, there is. There's a, 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 a Westminster Borough team called, called the Orb Team. So it's the Oxford Street, Regent Street and Bond Street team that, that have got a, a wealth of knowledge around uh, things that they can use uh, um, to deal with basically the antisocial part of, of pedicab uh, riders. So they, they, they don't really have an effective means to deal with safety, but they can deal with antisocial stuff. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's incredibly resource intensive to build up the level of evidence required, and I think as Kevin referred to earlier in terms of the, the what's called a CPN is issued eventually, it, it takes a long time. Um, and I've, I'm, as, as I've, I think colleagues have said, I think with regula better regulation, hopefully we, we could encourage sort of better behaviour. Okay. Michael, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, certainly in other European cities, um, the, uh, the both bicycles and pedicabs um, do uh, operate in pedestrian, pedestrianised areas um, without causing a problem. Um, obviously, they're not going super fast in those areas. They're expected to go, um, it's called um, walking pace. You know, um, and, and places which are super busy in the middle of town, maybe the, the, the bikes would then be restricted after a certain time. So, after, so they can only go maybe after 9, 10 p.m. until 7, 8, 8 a.m. the next morning. Um, because then those pedestrian areas are, uh, are less populated. So, uh, and then in other cases as well, there's um, on the issue of uh, one-way streets, there's um, it's a lot more common in Europe where you have uh, contra lanes in many, many one-way roads where bikes and pedicabs can go against the, the flow of traffic because they're not they're not not very big, a meter, one meter twenty. You know, you can't compare it to a car, um, and that does. Uh, ease a lot of the problems. You know, if, if, if generally, th when there's any kind of law or regulation, it's generally through the going with the flow or the consensus of what the people are doing, what they want. And if you can see that a lot of bikes are are making shortcuts through one-way streets that they shouldn't, maybe you know you should put a contra flow through that uh, through that area, and that would then solve problems for everyone. When you talk about these pedestrian areas, where pedicabs and bikes can go. Are they cycle lanes there or it's just a flat open pedestrian area? No, uh, in some cases there are cycle lanes, uh, but in many cases it's simply, you know, there's no, they, they go wherever they want. There's no cycle lane, it's just kind of expected. 
that the you know the pedestrians and bikes are kind of in the same class. <coughs> you know, they're not gonna. They're not, no one's. It's very unlikely that someone's gonna die when they get hit by a, a bicycle or a pedicab. It's, it's yeah, highly yeah. unlikely. Yeah. And maybe the, 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 uh, there'll be light regulation saying there, there'll be like um, <coughs> like I say walking pace or a slow tempo. So just then, that, then there'll be a sign there saying, okay, to warn people of that, and obviously if someone is not paying attention, then maybe they would get a fine or be stopped. Just, just goes back to a comment that Ross made about London being unique. You're talking about um, cultures that are more of a cycling culture than London, I would imagine. And I'd ask TFL this, do you feel you have the, the space on the roads to perform those sort of contraflows in places? And I, I say it in the West End because it looks like to me around Regent Street, Piccadilly, <coughs> traffic is increasingly being pushed out. Could that traffic be replaced by this sort of scheme? I couldn't answer across network. I mean, we, we TFL only look after five percent of the roads. The majority of roads we're talking about are, are borough roads. So it's quite a big statement to say yes. I, I couldn't answer that. Was, maybe I should I, 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 <laughs> direct I, I, it to Kevin. I, I think the answer is it would be inappropriate to speculate on the impact of removing traffic from some of the key arterial routes to facilitate pedicabs. If you are no, not to facilitate pedicabs, to facilitate, we, we people seem to be removing traffic anyway. That seems to be a general direction. So I'm not talking about facilitating pedicabs. I'm saying once that traffic is gone, or as a replacement, and cycling in general, rather than pedicabs in particular. I would argue from a borough that the cycle superhighways that have gone in Westminster have created more congestion than they've gone in. And if you use Vauxhall Bridge Road, it's a car park for 45 minutes most times of the day. Okay. So I think you know that we. Yeah. TFL have developed a very sensitive um, traffic modelling um, tool, which we've used very well in Oxford Street, and you can judge the impact of traffic changes or scheme changes on the border network. I think, you know, the problem of congestion within within um, London is a combination of TFL as a strategic authority and the local boroughs to plan, and something that Westminster does, or the city of London does, or Southwark does, can have massive implications for the TFL network in Bexley, Bromley, or elsewhere, and we, we just have to be sensitive to that. Okay, thank you for that. Chair, thank you. Yeah, just very briefly, get back to uh, anti-social parking show, saying, Hello, Ros, by the way. Hi, Steve. Yeah, good to see you. <laughs> Exploit only. Um, you, you talked about sanctioning against anti-social parking, and again, I, I don't have any experience of these wonderful vehicle modes down in Croydon, perhaps we should have some. Um, perhaps we will now. Um, but Count's talking to Kevin, probably more so, and, and Sean, I mean, Local authorities and, and, and TFL aren't slow to sanction antisocial parking. They buzz around our moped and slap fines all over the shop. Why aren't you sanctioning, if you're saying that pedicabs are parked up and causing blockages and parking illegally, why aren't you, with respect to these guys, slapping FBNs and fines and God knows what? Uh, well, or do they just cycle off and clear off and see you coming? What, what is the frame of reference to, what is the frame of reference to pursue them for the fine? There is no vehicle identification number. There is no oh, registration oh, plate. There is no address. There is no identity of the driver. Right. If if Michael was wearing a certified pedicab license rider, right. and he was parked illegally, I'd have something to actually issue him with a ticket, right. his home address. So, until you, pardon the reference to regulate, until you <laughs> regulate the ability, to, yeah. I, yeah. there's nothing that TfL or Westminster other than move on. Seize yeah. if it's particularly if yeah. it's a particular problem or or deal with an obstruction. Okay. So if they're obstructed, your guys will go along and, and you, you, you at the moment we'll get on to it. You have no sanction as such, and and the fellows will probably just or girls will just cycle off. And you I mean the, the no, first no, no. the first action is to move on if, yeah. in a, uh, okay. hopefully with with you know agreement. Yeah. But as 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 Sean said, compiling a case to take any form of legal action is is, is uh, with the powers that we which have, have which are limited. Yeah. Which we'll um, get Thank yeah. you. Thanks for that. Oh, sorry. So, so, I, I, I think it's important to get some sort of perspective on on on, on, on this. I mean, it, it, a lot of this. I know we're talking about pedicabs, but it's it's, it's pedicabs that are causing all this, this congestion. I mean, we're all around <laughs> London all the time. I mean, all sorts of other vehicles. Cause, I know that. Cause, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that this is an, an issue that we've uh, the, the ranks issue and inappropriate parking has been absolutely. Uh, discussed in enormous detail with TfL and with Westminster City Council, not with these two gentlemen, but this is before their time. But it's absurd that we're at this position now, because in 2008, Martin Lowe got permission 
got signs permission for pedicab ranks, the road signage, all the signage approval from the DFT. We had, uh, uh, we'll come on to the regulation, but we had something in place with, which was agreed with TfL, Westminster Council and the Metropolitan Police. And that is a decade ago. So we'll come back to that. Okay, but, you, you know, it, 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 yes. Okay, thank you. I want to move now to touting and pricing, David. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, there's been concerns that some of the fares that pedicabs have been charging their customers, particularly tourists who might be uh, in London for the first day and don't know what's going on, have been charged. We hear cases of uh, one tourist being charged over £200 for a one-mile journey and £600 for a 30-minute journey. Um, what needs to be done to eliminate fare abuse? Oh, whoever would like to, to answer, Chris. Yeah. It, it, obviously, that's totally unacceptable. In, in, uh, in, in, in the way it should be done is that there should be a fair guideline in the pedicab and the fare should be agreed prior to the start of the journey. Properly agreed. And I, 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 you know, that, that, that's, this, this has been an issue which is obviously raised uh, and, uh, and must be addressed. And again, you know, with, with identification, then should something like this happen, then of course there would be, a, there would be some sort of recourse. But at the moment, you're quite right. Yeah. Um, yeah, did anyone else want to comment? Yeah, yes. Just, just to echo that, I think, um, you know, we've got lots of footage, camera footage of pedicab drivers charging complete rip-off fares, mm. um, whether they're taking passengers on long routes or just deciding that they, instead of 15 pounds halfway down the road, they've decided it's 50 pounds. And so for tourists who perhaps English isn't their first language, mm. maybe in an area that they are unfamiliar with, um, you know, that, that's, that really does damage our reputation as a tourist destination. So I think it's really easy. It's, you have set fares, you know, mm. Examples of this all around the world, all around the country. Um, you have set fares. These fares are transparent. They're there in front of you, um, or it's you know it's one fare regardless of where you might be going within a certain radius, um, and it's as easy as that. But you again, how, how do you enforce that unless we have some kind of regulation? Yeah. Yes. Just very briefly yeah. on that. The the the, the 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 legislation under which pedicabs operate is that they have to charge uh, separate and distinct fares. So we always had a system where it would be uh, X amount per person per mile. So of course, if you're taking one person, or three people, it's a lot more work than if you're doing, taking one. So uh, the, under the legislation, which still exists, um, it's, it, they have to charge per person uh, and, uh, for, for, for any journey. Is, is, the legis is that the 1869 That's Metropolitan right, yeah. Public Carriage Act? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, so that's enforceable, is it? That if if a if a pedicab Absolutely. now does not give a separate, distinct fare, then that's yep. enforceable. In the law. That's right. Is there, that could be enforced. No, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's no price guide though, is there? So they can sort of set whatever they want for the separate and distinct fares. Is that is that? We, we used to have a rule. I think uh, was it. Three pounds per person per mile, or something. No, it was a uh, when you started. It was about five pounds a person per mile. Obviously, okay. according to inflation now, it must be about seven fifty. Must be at, at right. least that. Uh, I'd say per okay. mile. But that person. Um, yeah. So, th th and, uh, another place they have price lists, so people mm. can see that on the bike, and it may be by destination from the town hall, or whatever, to this place or that place, and. They have a list so the, the, right. the, the visitors or tourists can see what, what they're going to be charged. Um, but then, of course, there's, a, there's always this, um, uh, you know, this trader mentality. You know, it, it depends on the, you know, let's be honest, it can depend on the weight of the person or, you know, there's mm. a lot of the weather. There's lots of different factors you can take into account. So that's why there should only be gu guidelines, I'd say, because, you know, it's, uh, it's like any business. Even in a supermarket or a shop, no price is absolutely fixed until you walk out the shop, until you accept that price and pay it. It's not accepted. Yeah, you don't have to. You, uh, okay. It's the same with a pedicab. If, if people are not, people and tourists should be uh, agreeing up front what the price is. And I think in, um, maybe uh, through tourism, for, for example, in, uh, in, in, in Berlin, for example, uh, in a lot of the tourist books, like uh, Lonely Planet, Rough Guide, 
the, there'll be articles in there and it'll, there'll be the, the price per hour, you know, so the tourists know when they land in that city, okay, these are the bikes, they're available, that's what an hour should cost, for example. So this definitely, when it, working with the tourist board or other places, this can definitely help to self-regulate the, the business, mm. you know, so when people know what the price is. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Ross, did you want to come in? That, that's very encouraging to hear that there's lots of good practice out there. Um, I think we also need to learn from um, what has been successful in London. So with the black cabs, you know, now very little transaction is done through cash in hand. Um, I imagine that the majority of the pedicab transaction is cash in hand. Um, and of course, I encourage people to work and to want to work, but I think we need to make sure that income is being declared as well and no tax avoidance. Um, but I'd like to see, you know, through the process that we do move to um, a system where, which relies less on cash and, and more on um, electronic transaction, because I think the black cabs has demonstrated that that is a successful way forward. Well, one thing, uh, just to pick up on the the um, pricing, and you, you mentioning that in, in some cases a price list would be good. Are, are p the pedicabs obliged under the 1869 Act to put up a price list? They're not obliged to do that. So if they don't and they just make up a price at the end, they are actually illegally allowed at the moment not yeah. to specify a price at the beginning and just charge at the end, is that correct? But I think <coughs> under, yes, and then, but okay. I think under any sort of any sort of regulation, however it was done, mm. there would be some guidelines which would have to have to be on, on the pedicab very clearly. So it, yeah. you know, it's this amount per person per... Right, but that's something that needs to be done. Absolutely, it's not the case yeah. at the moment, which is where the problem is, particularly for tourists who, <coughs> as you say, Ros, may come to London and not know English very well, so they're very vulnerable. Uh, in that situation. Um, what does TfL do, or what can TfL do at the moment to uh, make sure there isn't uh, any fair abuse like this you know, £600 for a 30 minute journey? Is there anything you can do? No, not really, no, not, not without any, any appropriate legislation. I think that's the, that's the problem and we were well aware that the people that could use pedicabs, tourists or, or people that have been out are, are vulnerable to mm. being charged far, far too much. Well, I do appreciate your honesty, and that, that really just shows that it's a very, very urgent situation that we need some, some le new legislation and, and regulation on this. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, sorry, did you want to come in? Yes. I did, if I could, please. Um, we've obviously been focusing on um, pedicabs because that's what this meeting is set up to look at, but there are bicycle taxis operating in London, like Pedal Me App, um, where the prices are completely um, competitive with minicab prices um, and the pricing is done through an app, the Pedal Me app, you can download it and book a ride. Um, so has anyone thought about producing an app for um, pedicab uh, riders to use to do the pricing with or is that something that would have to follow on after regulation? Michael, do you have anything? Uh, I think a few uh, companies and even cities have, have tried that or are in the process of trying it. The main problem is, at the moment, is um, uh, you're obviously on a, a pedal bike. You, you don't have an engine. Where, where, how do you power your, your phone the whole time to run the app? Um, you know, uh, it, it, it was tried, and then it's just when you have that app constantly running in the background, it's obviously draining power, so it wasn't practical from that point of view. Obviously, in a motorised vehicle, it's practical and it works. So maybe there's another way around that in the future, but we haven't. I'm not aware of anyone that's found that solution yet. Right. Perhaps it works if people have got e-assist bikes. Maybe they can keep them keep them more charged up or something. But yeah, um, I mean, if you if you had a, a larger electric uh, battery, for example, maybe that's a possibility. Yeah. Okay. And TfL, have you? Uh, are, you are you? I mean, in terms of. Um, uh, the, are you aware of organisations like Pedal Me App who are...? I, I've heard of not that familiar with their pricing structure. Um, so well, perhaps uh, I, I'll make an introduction please, after, the, after the meeting because it does seem, um, you know, we've heard that bicycle taxis are a novelty ride, but actually what Pedal Me App are showing is that these can be a really useful part of our um, transport system um, and given that we've got a mayor who's trying to tackle air pollution 
having bicycle-driven um, transport is actually potentially a really good thing for London, which is why when we get on to regulation, I'm sure you know, we'll be able to, to discuss how we can sort all the problems <coughs> that we've been talking about already. Can I, can I just come in? I'm, I'm not aware of that particular app, but you, you're seeing uh, an increase, and TfL are very aware of this as well, of dockless cycle hire schemes, which are app or key code um, driven, which are obviously a rival to the fixed docked Santander um, scheme. We, we will have the same problem as local authorities where 200 bikes appear on your streets overnight. You can go and pick them up, you can download the app, you can hire them against a schedule of fees. They cause obstructions, they can be dumped anywhere. There's no facilities to actually rank them or bring them together. Um, TFL drive around collecting their bikes and relocating every night. So we're starting to see a similar issue emerging on Dr. Cycle Hire and TFL have already drafted a code of practice, and with, as with pedicabs, there are there's really good engagement to try and develop a, a protocol and a voluntary scheme to actually make this work. But it presents if another example of the lack of regulation potentially creating further challenges. I completely get and support the whole sustainability, different ways of transport, air pollution agenda. But people falling over bikes on roads in Soho is not safe. I think I absolutely agree with you, but I think the, um, the dockless bike hire, they've, um, because TfL acted very fast on the first, the O bikes that came in and that were just dumped, the companies that are now operating are working very closely with local authorities um, before they're able to operate and they've got a sort of memorandum of understanding. I th I th I'm sorry, but we are wandering well off pricing here. We've been doing pricing. So we can maybe come back to under, yep. under regulation. Can, can I just say one thing before we move on? I'd, I'd be concerned if we were considering pedicabs as a major transport solution. Yes. Um, I think we've got enough transport solutions to, to consider and I would encourage walking as an alternative to pedicabs. Lovely, thank you. All right, moving on to the final section now, um, and we are running a bit over. So, regulation, Joanne, waiting patiently. Yes, regulation. I think from the answers you've given so far, some of my questions have been answered. But if I could just sum up briefly, I think all of you are in favour of regulation, and is it correct that all of you agree that the current um, statutory powers you have are insufficient? Is that a fair thing to say? Okay. Can I, can I come on that if we were to regulate, what sort of regulation it would be? Um, with vehicles themselves, Chris, you said that the, um, is it the ISO actually have looked at a, a, a BS, BSI. Sorry. Have <coughs> looked at a, a standard. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean they, they came up with a proposal which I sent to, 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 to both TfL and yeah, to the right, DFT. Okay. To, to do a, 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 a to prepare a standard for a what's called a PAS a PAS standard for pedicabs, um, which, as I understand it, is still there. I mean, it's it's not cheap, <coughs> but what you know what it does do is it will set the, a standard, which is probably not massively different to to, to the standard that would that, that, that t we'd, agree, we'd agree with TfL ten years ago. Um, but yes, that can be done. Thank you. And if I can ask Sean. Is, is a standard of vehicle you'd be looking at. And can I ask you also, um, Michael's talked about in other cities, do they have standards of vehicles as well? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, I, I think principally for us, the safety of, of the passenger is, is paramount. And at the minute, there's no guarantee of, of what kind of pedicab that you or I could go into. And I think without regulation, I think for us, the most important thing around it is, is to guarantee that, that a vehicle meets a set standard which is safe and meets an ISO standard or, or an equivalent. Um, I think that's really important with driver, driver identification so that yeah. should something happen, a passenger has got means by which to A, know the driver and, and, uh, and that the vehicle's safe. And if you like, that vehicle then would be issued with an identification number or plate Yeah, there's, a, there's a whole host of means by which the, the, the vehicles are, are licensed and regulated that, that could help with it from an enforcement perspective and most importantly from a passenger safety perspective. Thank you. Michael, you wanted to come in. Um, yeah, rewind. <laughs> um, okay. What were you saying before? Just About whether other cities have standards on pedicabs. Yeah. I was saying the, 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 I think the responsibility should begin with the manufacturers. 
A lot of the rickshaws are European made, either England, Germany, uh, Denmark. They like, seem to make up the build of the market. And generally, the, the, the bikes made in Europe are of good build quality. If there's a poor build quality, it's, it'll be the ones coming from China, the cheap imports. Um, so we'd want alignment with the EU. Sorry? We'd want alignment with the EU. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we are responsible enough. <laughs> um, you know, every, every, yeah. I think there's, there's bikes made here as well okay. in the UK. Um, but anyway. Yeah. Right. And then the, uh, resp uh, what they do there as well is they have a type of MOT. So certainly in Germany it's every five years. So the bike then needs to go in for a, a check, make sure it's still structurally safe. Yeah. And then they get a tick and then that's it. They, they, they carry on. It's very light. It doesn't need to be every year because obviously that costs money then for everyone. But yeah. Okay, yeah. so standards on vehicles, yeah. maintenance, whatever. And then rider training. Um, Chris, you talked about national standard level three. Um, does that um, incorporate and um, do, do <coughs> members of your organisation have to ensure that their riders get that level? Yeah, everyone had to have it. And yeah. we, 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 we actually, uh, the CTC trained an instructor. Yeah. So that was done, and then, uh, and then, and then we worked out um, with the CTC a work bike mod, 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 module to go on to the to add on to the national cycling standard level three, um, and that the idea of that was that it would cover pedicabs and work bikes because there's a lot of trishaws, if you like, that are going around the streets delivering goods and all that sort of stuff. So we thought uh, uh, with the CTC at that time that that um, that that was a sensible thing to do. And of course the CTC are the national cycling um, yeah. body, so. Yeah. And TFL, would that satisfy your need for regulation of drivers themselves? Driver sense, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And CRB checks, or DDMB checks as they are now, and presumably yeah, insurance as well. Can I just, just to yeah. add, yeah. this yeah. is a form of passenger transport. It should be regulated the same way as every other form of yeah. passenger yeah. transport. Yeah. Uh, and I think insurance, safety, uh, you know, the well-being of the driver, the, the yeah. condition of the vehicle, annual inspections. I wouldn't go as far as road tax necessarily, but it's a form of passenger transport. Yeah. It must be regulated in the way that you, or TfL, yeah. would expect it to be. So I'm just going um, through those things. They're the things you, you'd need. And then, Sean, if I can ask you, outside London, pedicabs are regulated in the same way of taxes. Correct, yeah. Is that the same regulation you're asking for, or you're asking for, is TFL asking for any extra regulation for pedicabs in London? Um, I don't think you can, in, within London, class them as the same. So it wouldn't be the same as, I think outside of London they're classed as, as taxis, whereas yeah. within London you can't. So it'd have to be um, a new regulatory scheme. Mm -hmm. So are there, are, there, are there any divergences from the taxi legislation that you've been looking for for pedicabs? It needs to be pedicab specific. It would be. Mm. Okay, Chris. You know, <coughs> I mean, I, I don't know what, how much the committee know about the background to this, but <coughs> the, the, you know the the, <coughs> the current uh, legislation under which which they um, they operate has been tried and tested many times, and then we worked with. Uh, then there's been a number of bills put before Parliament, um, either as London Local Authority and Transport for London bills, two of those. And there was there was uh, there was the uh, LA, the um, the road safety bill, the local transport bill, the GLA bill, and it's quite extraordinary that we're here today, having had all that lot put through. Now, what the reason the reason they didn't go through in any of those instances was because <coughs> there was an awful lot of wool being pulled over, an awful lot of eyes, and and the people who were tabling these pieces of legislation were absolutely trying to get rid of pedicabs, believe me. So that's why we fought so hard, both in uh, with the LLA bills and, and, and obviously MPs or members of the House of Lords fought on, on, on our behalf in, in government bills, because the, the, in each and every case, they'd been fatal to the pedicab industry, because very often they've been driven by the taxi driver, so it's important to say that. But subsequent to that, um, there were a number of, uh, of um, plans uh, which we worked with, with uh, both TfL and, as I said earlier, the police, TfL and Westminster City Council. I had n no less than 50 meetings with 
Westminster Council on this with Martin and a, a great number with TfL. And we, we worked this out with a, a wide coalition of people. It was the police, it was TfL, it was the, the TfL lawyers, the Westminster City Council lawyers. And we, we, we got to the point of agreeing. Uh, a, a very broad a, a, and a very, it, it was, it, it was a, a, um, relatively light touch, but nevertheless robust. And when the final, we, so we agreed this with all the lawyers, and then when the, 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 the final sort of structure of this registration scheme, it was called, came out, it was unrecognisable as the, 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 the document that we'd agreed. So we, um, the, 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 the DFT, as we, you know, in, in 2012, this was all left to the DFT. No, no, we're not going to do anything because the DFT are going to be doing a, um, a, 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 a tabling some legislation in a government bill. Well, nothing's happened whatsoever, and my inform information is that it's nowhere near close to their radar. So I sent, sent a, 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 a document which was essentially based on what on, on, a, on, on, a, on a registration scheme that we'd agreed with TfL and Westminster Council and the police a long time ago, um, in, in fact in 2008. And we also got council opinion on this um, at our expense, which, which, which describes quite clearly how the police, to give the police some powers to act against people who cannot be identified. That's, that's the key thing. And, and I, I'm quite happy to, you know, that the, the, um, the, 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 the Transport Committee have actually, well, Val Shawcross did come back to me on this to say essentially that, 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 that it, this was a matter for the DFT and, and they wouldn't do anything. But the Mayor does have a responsibility for the safety of passengers and, and, and the people on the streets. Can I ask if you could send us that? That'd be yes, helpful. Yes, of course. Yeah. And, and, and I mu must add that yeah. the, 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 London, the, the, the London Assembly Transport Committee did a report yeah. back in 2005. I don't know whether people have yes. seen that. But, yeah. you know, yeah. this started the process. Yeah. And so it's been extremely frustrating for everybody. It's not, not you know, mm. it, it, and I understand that many people here haven't been involved in this yeah. for a long time. But, it, 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 you know, ped pedicabs are vilified and quite rightly so in many respects. But any industry, the, 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 the private hire in, industry was a chaos before the private hire act came in. And, and, and I, I, I agree there needs to be some, some regulation, but I think, you know, if it's, if it's a sledgehammer, it will crack the nut, it, 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 you know, and that, that's the difficulty with it. Can I ask, can Sean, I just, that, Sean Sorry, can that, I just sorry, interrupt, I, just um, one second, just interrupt, because we've got um, Christchurch Primary School just walked in, so I'd like to say hello to you guys. Great borough of Redbridge. I'm the <coughs> assembly member for Havering Redbridge, so lovely to see you guys. Uh, we're talking at the moment about pedicabs, which are the cycles in, in round Oxford Street and other areas. Um, and then after that, we're going to move on to talk with the former cycling czar who's come to see us, and that'll be talking about all things to do with bicycles and also the cycle superhighways and uh, the quiet routes. But lovely to see you. Thanks very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. So, no, Sean, can I ask you, what's TfL doing to persuade the DFT to bring this legislation forward? Um, we've worked very closely with Westminster um, and we'd welcome um, support from, from yourselves in terms of trying to progress this. I think we've met with, I don't know how many times, with, uh, with the Secretary of State and uh, his colleagues to try and push the regulation of, of pedicabs. I'm surprisingly, I've mentioned it many, many times. So. Are you hopeful? Sorry? Are you hopeful? Always hopeful. Kevin shaking his head there next to you. <laughs> we, we work very close to TfL on this particular issue um, and with the pedicab industry um, and our business partners as well. Um, we have lobbied and lobbied and lobbied. Uh, DFT were trying to, from memory, um, slip it into, I think, an Aviation Act, but then there was a snap election, so it disappeared off the books. Uh, we met the Minister, John Hayes, about two weeks ago and his, and his uh, um, civil servants put the case forward, provided the evidence base, um, similar to the Euro Pack. We were advised there was a committee looking at licensing and regulation generally and the committee chairman had agreed to slip this one on to the end of it for a conversation and then we had the pushback about parliamentary time, uh, um, primary legislation, secondary legislation. So. Um, we are not hopeful, uh, 
but we are continuing to work with colleagues and push the DFT for some action. Given that, uh, given the Brexit work and the legislative timetable that's going through, um, why haven't you pushed for a code of practice and to actually institute a code of practice? That, that was es essentially what... The, the that could be the basis of the doc. If you suppose agree, that could be a code of practice. That's right. I mean, the, 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 this, this was a registration scheme. So it, it, the, I'm sure that the, 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 the mayor's office mm. or, the, or the, the London Assembly must be able to... If, 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 if we can ban inappropriate pictures on the sides of buses and mm. the tube stations, the, the, the beach-ready things, surely... Well, the mayor we not might have the power to ban it, but... If there's no. a code of practice, yeah. people that are drive, riders that are licensed have photo ID, yeah. have their <coughs> suggested fares, uh, have had vehicle che checks, <coughs> um, have a badge, and you know, publicity <coughs> is that you only get into a pedicab if it's got a license attached to it. The, the, the problem is it's been all or nothing. So, so the, the TfL and Westminster City Council, and I've been in, at meetings where, where officers in TfL, both TfL and Westminster, have been absolutely quaking about the taxes. They are under enormous pressure from the taxi fraternity. So, and, 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 and uh, you, you know, th there's been some quite interesting altercations on that. But actually, um, it, 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 you know, if, if there was a will, there is definitely a way to do it, to, to, to introduce something that would, would, I believe, work. The police were very, very keen on this, by the way, because it would mean that they, they could then distinguish between people who were on the registration scheme and who'd signed a code of conduct and, and those who hadn't. So what that would then mean is that they, that, 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 that helped them massively in terms of enforcement because they can, could then use the Met Police Act of 1869, which is what they can use to distrain, and they can quite lawfully do that um, if they are unable to identify who, who is on a pedicab and, and the pedicab. And, and we had there's, a, there's there's an extract from the council opinion in this, which yeah. and, and the police were very keen on that, um, and I know that and, or, or, I don't think anyone here has, has been in, in involved for, for quite so long. So I'm not casting any aspersions on any, anybody here, but I'm sure everyone would agree it is absolutely absurd that this has been going on since 19 well really since 2003. When, when it, we started in 98, but in 2003 was when the, when the High Court case was won, and that's the point it started to go nuts. And, and, and prior to that, we were saying to Ken Livingston at the time, come on, we need to do something about this. And, and, and you know, so there's not, been, there's not been any resistance to doing it. So but you're saying TfL are running scared? Well, I, I, I've, I've been in meetings where TfL asked, you know, have been very worried. And, and, uh, Mary Dowdy uh, was was not happy about it, and Martin Lowe actually uh, was was uh, under a lot of pressure from the taxi drivers. So, so I, I mean, look, the taxi drivers we know that we, we, uh, are, are robustly defend their business, but I think, um, you know, the, the, between TfL, the police, and Westminster City Council, to set something up to at least start something mm. would, would just make so much sense because at the moment, um, you know, it, it, there's misinformation and misinformation and, you know, it, 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 it's, uh, as, we, as we've heard today, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot of fear being put into people's minds, but actually the reality is a, nearly all that could be sorted out quite quickly mm. with, 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 with uh, something like a registration scheme. Michael? I was adding to what Chris was say, saying there. Uh, in Munich, for example, there is a kind of voluntary uh, registration scheme with a, a kind of similar thing to a, like a cycle registration scheme. I, I don't know what it's called in London. But anyway, there, anyone, all the riders that tick all the boxes that have the, you know, the MOT and the insurance and uh, you know, the registration, they can get pick up this sticker, put it on their bike, then the police can visibly then see, okay, the rider has everything, they've been checked. We'll leave them alone and concentrate on the ones that don't have the sticker, and that's voluntary. That's it basically, just means that the, the riders don't want to get hassled or have their time wasted. They have mm -hmm. the sticker, and you know, it saves sense, everybody know, the time. It seems to me that the, the debate seems to have moved on from where it was a few years ago, where people were talking about banning. Um, Ros, I don't know because your organisation at that stage was saying 
ban. Is, is that what your organisation is saying more? Uh, have you I think, done? Although I said earlier, you know, London has its own specific needs, but if we do look, look across the world, um, I think we should learn lessons. And I think that banning hasn't been as successful as perhaps yeah. people think it's going to be when they, with the, when they set out on that route. So instead, um, for us, it really is about primary legislation. I think um, a licensing approach would be a good interim solution, but as long as it's just the interim solution, yeah. I still think that with the mayor's support, TfL support and joining us, that we should continue to actively push for legislation, for legislation in this parliament. Yeah. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Sean, as well. That code of practice, is that something you're prepared to look at, do you think? Absolutely. I think, I think the thing with voluntary um, regulation, I think, is that it will raise standards in certain areas. It's, it's, it's the areas that don't, or the, the individuals that don't sign up to it, I think, is a concern. And we're back into the inconsistent safety of vehicles. And, and yeah. I, I think fundamentally, I think... But I the alternative Ross, is doing nothing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think it's a step in the right direction, but I think really we'd agree with, with the primary legislation regulation route. Okay. Can I ask one other question? Well, t I've got two questions. Firstly, I know the mayor's asked, for example, on private hire vehicles to have a limit on the number of licences that are issued because of congestion concerns. Um, is that something you'd support on pedicabs, given that they are tend to work in a very small area, but there should be issues for X number of licences if, if, if a scheme is, that does come into place? Um, based on experience, I can see... Um, Generally, the, the flow of work there's a, there's a kind of, kind of a, there is a high turnover. You know, a lot of people come in for a, a few months in the summer, maybe seasonal, and leave. So by limiting it, it doesn't really make sense. How it works in Germany, they get a trader's license. They can work then anywhere in Germany. Um, um, <coughs> yeah, and that seems to work. The numbers don't seem to shoot up or go down. They seem to be maintained, and that's uh, I'd say put, you put that down to market forces, similar to how it works in London. When it was the economy was great, you know there was a lot more bikes a few years ago. Now there's a lot less. So I think it's in that way the economy self-regulates like it does in any market. Um, in places where they've set limits on the uh, number of licenses, like in uh, Amsterdam, for example, they it, it's uh, it sets up uh, the system for abuse by the, the companies or the people who've issued the license been issued the licenses. And if, for example, there they would issue them to a certain number of companies, and then the company then can charge astronomical prices for to rent a bike because they then hold a monopoly on, on the business, basically. So you have to be very careful about uh, any kind of restriction, um, because, uh, like I say, the this kind of the people look is very seasonal, or short term. People may do it for a couple of years. So, and I think it's self-regulates for the most part. I'm sure you had any comment on that. It would be useful to know, I mean, we've all said 400, exactly how many vehicles are we talking first before we start talking about limiting numbers? Yeah. Um, I, okay. I, I take your point about being yeah. seasonal, but I think it would be good to know total numbers before we even think about going further, about setting a limit. Okay. My final question is about accessibility. Because um, we pride ourselves in London about being a very accessible city on the whole, which to people have mobility problems or disabilities. Is there anything coming on the horizon that would mean that, um, with pedicabs, that they could be more accessible? Yes, certainly there is. Uh, certainly there's active um, groups and campaigns in both in De Denmark and Germany at the moment, where uh, I think Denmark was the first. It's a, it's really a state-sponsored scheme where you have uh, pedicabs uh, picking up people who are uh, maybe disabled or have mobility problems. You may be visiting them in their nursing homes or whatever and then taking them out for the day because you know they may not be able to get into a cab. Mm. And, uh, so there's, uh, and that's been operating as well in Germany for the last year or two. So there's, you can see there's definitely a scope there for that kind of uh, cooperation between the state and, and, and pedicabs because it does, yeah, I mean, if you're an old person, getting a bit of fresh air, a bit of sunlight, being out and about, seeing the city, which when you normally couldn't, because you can't able, you're not able to cycle anymore, it's, uh, you can see it brings a lot of uh, actually pleasure to a lot of people. Yeah. So could you regulate to have an accessible pedicab? Most, most definitely. Uh, so in, Denmark, in Denmark, they have a very low entry, um, kind of 
low, low, low entry to the yeah. pedicab, like a, lo a low step. So there's no problem getting in. You can, you can pretty much just crawl in. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, and then there's other ones which have steps, which, but generally the ones they use for the mobility purposes are uh, easily accessible. Uh, just a very, very small uh, step to, to between the floor and the, and the actual seat. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I've got, we, we are really running over on time, but I've got two more questions, if they can be quick, please. We've got David and Tom. David, did you want to come oh, up? Actually, please, yeah. Great, thank you, Tom. I was just a quick point to say, I've had an offer on Twitter from West Streeting MP to do as a 10-minute rule bill on pedicab. Wow, oh, fantastic. Wow, yeah. that sounds very good. There we go. Oh, yeah. uh, one of my members of Parliament, then. Yes, Indeed. Good. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, very good. Well, that's right, Tim, as well, then. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, that, that's, uh, yes, Chris. One last thing. All I'd ask the authorities, and, and, and having worked with the authorities for a long time, is that when, it, when, the, when the time does come for uh, putting some legislation, tabling some legislation about pedicab, it would be wonderful, actually, if, if we could be included in that discussion, because the, yeah. one of the problems has been in the past that we've been faced with something and then we found out by mistake, well, by, by, by research, yes. that actually that piece of legislation is fatal because Doesn't of this. Work. Yes. And, 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 you know, it's got to be something that works. And, and, yeah, and we'll be very happy to work with both TfL and Westminster to, 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 and, and the DFT, and I think the police is very important as yeah. well, mm -hmm. to, 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 to get something that's going to be, that, that's, that's going to be effective. Yeah, I, that's I what everyone right. wants, I think. I think you're right. The worst thing we could do is have legislation that just doesn't work. But Michael, you wanted to... I just wanted to add, there is already a scheme here in London, actually. There's a couple of riders who informally organised uh, uh, something with Great Ormond Street, and they take children out, which I... Yeah, so there is... Uh, I can put you in touch with the rider if you ever need to... Okay. Thank you. ...ever need that, or get in contact with, directly with Great Ormond Street. They'd yeah. be able to That'd be useful. Uh, put you in the right direction. Thank you. Right, we're saying goodbye to Christchurch. Cheerio, guys. Thanks for coming. See you again. All right, well, thank you so much for all your time, guys. It's been really interesting, very informative, um, very useful having the guys from the pedicab industry here and, and your knowledge of other cities has been invaluable, I think. But thanks also to the different authorities, Ross, Kevin, Sean, thank you. Chris, thank you. Thanks for all your help. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, guys. Well, it's the first time I've had a round of applause. All right, well, whilst uh, you're chatting, uh, I saw Andrew over there. Thank you, Andrew, for coming. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Robbie. We've got another guest coming now, so. Yeah. Uh, while we're waiting for that, we'll just quickly knock a couple of things out. Yeah. Item number nine, if we can do that. <laughs> agree the work programme for the remainder of the year. Well, I Agreed. And agree uh, to use the February meeting to meet with Val. The truck, uh, Deputy Mayor, and also note the record of site visits to Starship Technologies and Gateway Project as set out, blah, blah, blah. The date of next meeting, 10th of Jan. Yep, good. Thank you. Right.
Right, well now it gives me uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome Andrew, a man that uh, I worked with a few years ago actually when he was the cycling czar, he isn't anymore, but uh, you know, title did on his uh, cycling czar emeritus or something, I think the Latin. But um, anyway, we're now going to do uh, a section on all sorts of things to do with cycling and uh, cycling infrastructure mainly. So thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I'm going to kick off with the first question, and uh, it goes like this: You've been you've been <laughs> you have been critical of recent delays in getting the cycling infrastructure built. What do you think has gone wrong? Bearing in mind we've only got uh, about now. I, I think it's um, it's weak political leadership. Um, but the the key condition for uh, for cycling improvements to happen is, is strong political leadership and uh, I, I don't I think we've seen that in the mini Hollands um, in Waltham Forest and in Enfield which are the only um, schemes we've actually seen anything really happening on the ground in the last 19 months um, we haven't seen that from City Hall um, there doesn't seem any, didn't seem to be any real willingness to make decisions that um, that that uh, significantly alter the status quo on the roads. Okay, can I ask second and I'll come to you, Tom? Ah, uh, sure, sure, sure. um, fine. Oh, did you want to come in on that? No, 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 Secondly, is borough capacity still a problem for delivering schemes? And um, what are your views on plans for Cycle Super Highway 4 and Cycle Super Highway 9? Um, I think, broadly, borough capacity was always the most serious problem we faced. Um, uh, most boroughs, not, not very many boroughs are both willing and capable. Some boroughs were willing but not capable, some were capable but not willing. Only about five or six of the 33 were both. Um, and, uh, and it's very noticeable that in the borough-led schemes, with the exception of the, of, of the mini Holland boroughs, almost nothing has been achieved. Um, the Quiet Ways programme, for instance, uh, TfL says that there were supposed to be seven routes complete by, by 2017 um, and we've got you know, three weeks to go now and, and only one route is complete and, uh, and some routes haven't even started. Um, most of the meaningful improvements proposed on, under the Quiet Ways programme appear to have been dropped, um, things like the segregated lane on South Lambeth Road, uh, the bridge. Um, uh, a ramp being installed on a bridge that had steps uh, in the Olympic Park, uh, filtering in Hackney, filtering in Southwark, filtering um, in uh, in Lambeth. It's all been dropped, um, and I think that's partly that's partly due to the lack of leadership in City Hall. And it's also partly due to uh, a, a lack of real political will in in, in most boroughs. Um, and I think the Quiet Ways program was always the one where I, I was most worried about when I was. Um, you know, when I was cycling commissioner, actually, but uh, it's it's you know, it's it's even more worrying now. Um, it essentially seems to be more or less moribund. Um, according, you look at the TfL Quietway consultation website, hasn't been a borough-led Quietway consultation on any scheme since February, um, and uh, and and there are no active consultations at the moment. So it's difficult to know what's happening, um, but it doesn't look like very much. Tom, you wanted to come in. Yeah, it was also on, on CS4 and CS9, so I don't know if you want to ask yeah. those as well. I did ask those. Oh, yeah, did so I, I didn't ask on CS4 and CS9. I, I mean, I... I, I, I was going to say, I mean, do you... Do you, um, do you, you I mean, you've praised, I think, publicly CS4, haven't you? I praised CS9. Um, I think that is the only one, the only um, proposal put of the seven or eight put forward um, since the election that has... That, that, has a potential to deliver anything serious for cycling. I think it's a good scheme. Um, I think um, what, what we've seen um, since uh, since the election, um, we've we've seen a number of, we've seen a number of proposals. We've um, we've seen uh, uh, proposals at Campbellwell Green. We've seen proposals at Five Ways at Croydon, which basically make no change whatever, as far as I can see, to the status quo. Maybe slightly prettifying the pavements. We've seen uh, <coughs> proposals at Lambeth Bridge and uh, Waterloo IMAX, which um, which have 
benefits and disbenefits for cyclists. Um, so, you know, I, I think at Lambeth Bridge the benefits slightly outweigh the disbenefits. At Waterloo it's the other way around. I think there's a, you know, we're seeing a <coughs> quite significant narrowing of the road. Um, at Waterloo we're seeing a, a pretty, you know, cyclists forced into pretty dangerous movements there under the new proposals. Um, we've seen two superhighway proposals. Um, and as I say, CS9 is the only one really which meets the standards of the previous administration and it's the only one which you know, hasn't been watered down from the proposals we were working on. Um, I'm going to come to one of the previous administration's ones in a minute, but um, just so, so you're in favour of CS9. I want to ask you about what's your position uh, on the backlash um, against the proposals, uh, the proposal route through Chiswick? What's your view on that? Well, uh, my view is that a backlash is inevitable, really, whenever a meaningful scheme is proposed. Cycling schemes nearly always have substantial majority support. We found that in all our schemes. 60% um, support for the least popular, which was CS11, 85%, 90% support for the, for the most popular, which were the East, West and North, South. Um, and we, you know, we, we did find that cycling schemes always create a lot of noise. But we also found that noise was not the same as numbers. When the results came back in consultations and in a few cases of independent opinion polls, we found um, that, um, that you know that the opponents were in a small minority. Um, and I hope that will be the case here as well. But I think it's, you know it's, it, it is it is interesting the um, uh, the um, it, the level of backlash that there's been against CS9 and it's a sign that it, it is a good scheme um, because it does make um, an actual change to the status quo. The reason it's, why... It's an interesting view that you think a good scheme has had a lot of backlash. Well, it's, I, I, I think that's not the definition of a good scheme, but it's the nearly inevitable consequence You seem to be saying scheme. that the definition of a good scheme is it creates a, a lot of... No, I just said it wasn't the definition of a good scheme. The, 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 it's, it's the inevitable consequence of a good scheme. Um, because any, any change to the status quo, as I said, is going to produce opposition. But our experience was, with the East, West, North, South Superhighways and, and all the others, um, was that, that the opposition tended to be a, a pretty small minority. And how, how this administration's dealt with the um, likelihood of backlashes is, is mostly, I think, by um, you know, um, uh, not proposing anything meaningful. Uh, and that, that, that pretty much avoids it. So you, not, but, so you acknowledge, therefore, that making progress on schemes like this is difficult? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think it's, uh, but, but it's possible with political will, which is what I think is lacking at the moment here. Well, to, 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 uh, I, I, also, I think it, it demonstrates how important it is to get these proposals right. And that brings me to CS1. Why did you sign off Cycle Super Highway 1 when it clearly wasn't up to standard, particularly around Seven Sisters? And you've got this whole area where the Cycle Super Highway goes onto a very busy pavement. Mm. It's a, it, it, was, it was a compromise, inevitably. And it was, a, it was assessed as the, as the quickest and, and most convenient route, um, parallel to the A10, because it was, it was fast. It was far, Cycling on the, uh, along the parallel streets beside the A10 was faster than any scheme we could have put in on the A10 because there were fewer traffic lights. And, um, and the uh, proposals included substantial changes, some of which haven't been implemented, unfortunately, under the new administration. It's one of the schemes which you know, hasn't been finished under the new administration. Um, I think it's one where it wasn't the proposals weren't right in the first place. Do you think this demonstrates the important actually of importance of taking the time to listen to people and to get these schemes right, rather than having to make changes later on? On, on the whole, the complaint about our schemes was not of the nature you you made. Um, the complaint about our schemes was that they were too good in a sense that they that they gave too much to cyclists, that they took too much road space away from from motorists, that. Um, that that the you know certainly there wasn't there wasn't any um, opposition to CS1 from the road lobby. Um, there was substantial opposition, if you remember, to the east, west, and north, south, uh, to CS11 and to CS2, um, and those are very good schemes. So I think the, the lesson the lesson for me is that um, you need to consult, you need to build as much consensus as possible. Um, but you need to recognise too that for some people, for some opponents, you're, you're never going to be able to persuade them. You can't achieve unanimity on schemes. 
Um, and in the end, you had to decide. That the, the main weapon of our opponents wasn't, um, you know, the, our most sophisticated opponents weren't frontal. Um, their, their main weapon was the filibuster. They'd say, you know, they'd give us the impression that they might be able to be won over if, you know, we, we, we had a longer consultation or we, or, or we did this, this, that and the other. But we, we learned in the end um, that uh, no consultation could ever be long enough. Okay, very substantial periods of consultation, but, uh, but for a lot of people, no consultation could have been long enough. So, you know, you have to consult, you have to build as much consensus as possible, but in the end, you have to decide. And as you've acknowledged, this is a difficult process. Yeah, but I, I, just, I, don't, I just don't feel that much progress is being made in it. We, we left a new administration with nine um, TFL-led schemes, designed up, publicly consulted on, all of them approved with large majorities in public consultation, as I say, the smallest is 60%. Um, and of those nine, all came to a halt for the first nine months. Um, and then at the beginning of this year, one restarted, um, and then another one has restarted during the year, and then the third one, the North-South Superhighway Extension, I think, has restarted about three weeks ago. But the other six um, have either been cancelled or remain in limbo. Um, and, uh, and we haven't seen... You know, we haven't seen any progress on some major schemes. We haven't, uh, we haven't yet, for instance, had a decision on Cycle Super Highway 11, which is a relatively <coughs> modest scheme. Um, it involves the closure of some gates to a park, but 21 months after the consultation closed, the mayor still hasn't made a decision on it. Uh, and I think that's that's a symptom of the of the you know the, the general lack of energy that there is in the program now. Can I move on to quiet ways? Does anyone else want to come in? On uh, no, Caroline. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting hearing your perspective that boroughs, there are still challenges, you're saying political leadership, but is there not a challenge with TfL that cycling still isn't in their DNA, it's just something on the side and add-on or we ought to think about that? And how, you know, how can um, the new Cycling and Walking Commissioner try to change that whole approach within TfL? I mean, to work with as a bureaucracy, TfL was actually... You know, I think a lot better than, for instance, Whitehall. Um, uh, they were quite responsive when they realised it was something the mayor actually wanted to do. Um, and they produced some fantastic schemes and they did them really well. Um, the schemes we delivered on the road, I think, are some of the best, perhaps the best in Britain. Um, but, uh, but you're right. Um, there's a, if, they, if they don't think there's much political commitment and interest, then then they lose interest. Um, and, and I do think there's been a, a, a relapse. Um, and I think the, the there are also always, there's, there's always constant pressure to do things badly, um, constant pressure to compromise in ways which, which you know, make schemes um, worth less than they should be or worth nothing. Um, and part of the Cycling Commissioner's job, part of my job when I was Cycling Commissioner, was to prevent that. Um, and again, I, I, I'm quite successful in preventing quite a lot of that, and not, not everything, not everything we did was perfect. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's what needs to happen now. Um, TfL ultimately, if a strong enough political steer is given for the mayor, they will do it. That was my experience. They, they sometimes took their time to come round. You have to have arguments sometimes, but on the whole, they will do it. They were quite, you know, they produced some pretty good schemes. So they will only do it if it's a strong political steer. It's not sort of built into how no, they approach I, I, that's, everything. I, I think, I mean, if you, if you cut TfL open, um, you would probably find a bus in its heart. Um, <laughs> uh, or an underground train, possibly. But I think a bus. Um, and, uh, and, and, I mean, a, a lot of people took the view that, for instance, um, uh, um, a, a, a rise in the number of people using buses is automatically a good thing and a decline in the number of people using buses is automatically a bad thing. Well, of course, it's a bad thing if they're using cars instead, but it's not a bad thing if they're using bicycles instead because it's more sustainable, it's cheaper, it's better for them, all that kind of thing. Um, that, was, that was part of a, um, the mentality that we had to counter at TfL. But, but as I say, I, mean, I, I, you know, I had my... I had my moments with them, but I really, I, you know, I was really thrilled with the quality of the work that they did and, 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 and what, they, what they produced on the ground. And, and it, it could not have happened without the commitment of 
vast commitment of dozens, at, at one point hundreds of people in TfL who really, really did work hard at it. And so it's, it's perfectly possible. TfL's, you know, TfL will do what the mayor wants. Okay, and um, the current mayor's agenda is around cycling and walking, the healthy streets mm. programme that he wants throughout. Um, do you think um, they're going to have an uphill challenge trying to get that throughout every aspect of TfL? I can see a couple of problems with healthy streets. Um, it's actually cycling, walking, and buses. Um, and motorcycles. We've yeah, as well. but bus. I mean, buses seem to have made a, a, an entry to the healthy streets. I'm not quite sure how buses are a healthy mode of transport. Really, if you look at the average, you know, so if you look at say Kilburn High Road or something, which is full of not not very full buses pumping out lots of now. rather nasty exhaust fumes doesn't look particularly healthy to me but um but but buses are in there in healthy streets i, I i'm concerned about three things I, I i think firstly the potential for conflict between some of the healthy or the allegedly healthy modes themselves um uh, and certainly in um in, in my time regular attempts were made to stop cycling schemes on the grounds that they cause delay to bus passengers um and we had and, and our approach was to try to balance that um rather than to say that cycling themes cannot happen. Um, and uh, there's even, I think, there's not a complete community <coughs> of interest between cycling and, and walking, uh, as we've seen in Oxford Street, for instance. Um, and my worry about healthy streets is that where the interests of cycling and walking are uh, conflict or, or are deemed to conflict, then the decision will come down against walking, uh, against cycling, um, as it has in Oxford Street. Um, and I think... Um, I, I, my other concern, I mean, if, if, if the perp Healthy Street's declared objectives are to, um, to reduce dependence on motorised transport, um, to uh, increase, um, clean up the environment and to increase people's health. And, and actually there is a very successful, you know, a clearly successful policy instrument in cycling that, that does those things, the cycle superhighway. We've seen huge rises in the number of people cycling. We've seen big modal shift in cycling. We've seen significant increases in the capacity of roads given those cycle lanes. The overall capacity, of course, not the capacity for motor vehicles, but the capacity for moving people. Um, so we, we have a policy instrument in, um, in cycling um, with, a, with a proven record, both here and abroad, of, of swiftly and massively increasing the number of journeys made by healthy modes, sustainable modes. Now, I, I can't think of any equivalent for walking which could have the same effect so quickly. I mean, the policy instruments available, things like wider pavements, ease of pedestrian crossings, lower traffic streets, they are smaller, they're more incremental. They don't have the same game-changing potential um, that the super highway has for cyclists. So that, 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 is, that is also a concern of mine about healthy streets. But you know, perhaps that's the point. Perhaps the fact that walking infrastructure doesn't represent so big a change to the status quo, it's what makes it attractive to the, to the mayor. Okay, thank you. Sean, did you want to come in? Just to expand on a point you've made there, is, is the seeking to expand walking and cycling, you seem to be suggesting that you could be expanding walking at, at the cost of cycling. Is that your sort of position? Well, I, 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 we, we tried. What, what we tried to do was balance the interests of the two groups. Um, there were very significant benefits for walking and pedestrians in all our schemes. In the uh, East-West Secret Highway, for instance, there are 23 new pedestrian crossings. There were improvements to dozens of others, you know, meaning you didn't have to wait in the middle of the road anymore. You could cross in one go. Um, there were, um, uh, I, I can't remember the exact figure, but there was a very substantial amount of new pedestrian space as well. So we tried to balance improvements for walking and cycling. We didn't see it as a... Um, a, a, as a contest between the two. Um, and, and I think actually the same approach could have been adopted by the current administration in Oxford Street, for instance. I think Oxford Street's 180, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a wide street. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, th there's, there's enough room there, I think, for a cycle track as well as more than ample pedestrian space, but it's been decided not to have a cycle track and the, and the, uh, and the um, Interests of cycling have been barely considered in the consultation. They get three sentences in the consultation. There's a, there's a, there's a promise of, you know, a, a route on parallel streets, but they can't even say what streets is going to be on, let alone what kind of a route it's going to be. Um, and, and my understanding is actually going to be um, the existing London Cycle Superhighway, London Cycle Network route in uh, New Cavendish Street, which is about half a mile north of Oxford Street and, and isn't really a realistic alternative to Oxford Street 
at all. So that's my concern. I, I think it is possible to balance the, the, the two, which we did quite successfully, and certainly with the approval of, of most pedestrians groups. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure that balance is being achieved in the healthy streets at the moment. While I'm in, in earlier session, I asked a question about why Oxford Street hadn't considered the use of pedicab and cycle routes in general. Why I might agree with your position, I think. Do you think that's the case because businesses are less interested in cyclists? Because cycling is a serious part of our infrastructure for travel. Yeah, but Oxford I mean, Street's focus is sort of business. Some, some businesses want to create. I mean, in Oxford Street, the, the new West End Company's vision of London is basically a kind of outdoor sh outdoor shopping mall you know it's just a, um you, you come in you, you come in but it's it's basically a west field without a roof on um and i, I think I, I actually don't think that's all there is to london i don't think it's just a retail center it's a place for you know all sorts of people to do all sorts of things um and uh but it's interesting in in terms of businesses there's quite a lot of business opposition to oxford street um if you look at the if you look at the business responses to the, the first consultation the in principle consultation done early this year, I think, or last year, the majority of businesses around Oxford Street are against the pedestrianisation. Um, uh, and I think um, that's not necessarily because they support cycling, of course, but, but it, it does show it, it's not quite as clear cut as, uh, as everyone thinks. Um, I, I, I think traditionally business has been quite hostile to cycling. Um, we saw a lot of opposition from businesses in Waltham Forest to. Uh, the, the mini Holland schemes we did there. Now that opposition has really substantially vanished, not entirely, but very substantially vanished, as they now see what you know what happened in Waltham Forest is what happened everywhere that cycle infrastructure has been improved. It, it it's dramatically good for business. Um, we've seen for the first time in in years there are no vacant shops on Orford Road, which is one of the first areas that we did in in part of the uh, mini Holland's scheme in Walthamstow. We've seen the man who, who uh, led the opposition, a business owner who led the opposition to uh, the Mini Holland scheme, who, who, uh, who I last saw carrying a golden coffin uh, at the opening of the, of the Mini Holland in 2015. We've seen him opening a pavement cafe um, uh, because of the um, improved environment that we've got um, in Orford Road now. Um, and and what, what, so cycling is extremely good for business and, and actually when we put schemes in, that's, people see that. There's another scheme in Hernhill, not one of ours, a very controversial um, pedestrianisation of that road in front of the station, if you know that, or semi-pedestrianisation, removal through traffic from it. Massive controversy over that. All the businesses were up in arms against it. But, uh, but now you go on the website of the Hernhill Society and you find, a, find something saying, we can't imagine why we opposed it. Um, it's transformed Hernhill. But you've got, to, you've got to make the case by doing, um, and they're not doing anything, that's the problem. Um, and, and you know, once you've made the case by doing, once you actually do it, people see uh, what a good thing, what a profoundly good thing, what a wonderful thing for our city it is, uh, and you've just got to do it. So, just, just a very last question. Do you think the Mayor has the right idea around walking and cycling, but he's using the wrong he, he, says, he says the right things, but I, I don't see any evidence at all, none, um, of the will to put words into action. Um, the only test that matters is action on the grounds. There have been lots of promises and statements about encouraging cycling. There's been next to no action. Uh, um, I, I, think, I, I think the Healthy Streets has a couple of unresolved contradictions in it that, that need to be resolved. Um, and uh, and, and that's, 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 that's another thing I'm concerned about. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right, um, we're moving on to quiet ways now, Tom. So I, I do think, in terms of words and action, isn't the Mayor doubling the cycling budget? But has he spent it? Well, no, that's so that, 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 you know, that, 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 that's 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 Tom, that's 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 on quiet ways, um, you didn't finish a single quiet way when you were uh, the cycling commissioner, and in fact, I think you described the pro quiet ways program and your watch as a failure. Earlier, you talked about the need for strong political leadership. Where was the strong political leadership there on your watch? The difficulty with the quiet ways program was that it ran almost entirely on borough roads, and as I said before, most of the boroughs lack lack the political leadership necessary. A handful did not. Um, we did, in fact, deliver one. One quite way route, quite way one, um, but uh, but 
the um, uh, but you know, the, the, we, and we had the political leadership necessary there for the borough's concern. But but it, it really was quite difficult to get the boroughs to do anything serious on their roads. Uh, it, I mean, a proposal for filtering or uh, or even removing a bit of parking could be derailed by a handful of objections from residents, and that's that's what tended to happen. That was your role as commissioner to, to bring these these actors together and to and, and, and to get results. We managed that um, on the Mini Hollands. We managed it in the super highways. We managed it in the junctions. We managed it on lorries. We managed it to a little extent on quiet ways, but nothing to nothing like the extent that I wanted. Um, how successful do you think the two quiet ways that are open have been? Well, I think quiet way one is pretty good. Um, it is filtered. Um, it's 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 one I that's one I use regularly myself. It goes to Greenwich where I live, and I came on this morning. It seemed pretty busy. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, there are still areas which um, should have been done and haven't. Um, it's still not perfectly signposted in my view. But I think it works broadly very well. And it shows what the quiet ways could be. Um, quiet way two, I think you're referring to the, um, that, that goes from Bloom through to Walthamstow. That, what, what, that's really no more than a rebranding of an existing London cycle network. All they've done is taken down the London cycle network signs and put up quiet way signs and called it a new route. Uh, there are no significant changes as far as I can see. And indeed, most, as I said, the changes which we were proposing um, including filtering Hackney and Middleton Road and around London Fields were dropped by Hackney Council. Uh, and in the end, you know, uh, that, that, that happened after my time, but, um, but um, you know, it, in the end, it, it is up to the boroughs, it is their roads. And, uh, and um, having said that, I think we probably could have got a bit more done on the quiet ways than, 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 than has happened since. Um. What about good practice from other cities, either in the UK or internationally? What can we learn uh, when it comes to the design and operation of things like the quiet ways? Uh, I think um, there's a lot to learn from good practices in other cities in Europe. The, um, the, approach, the approach there isn't really a quiet way approach. My, my feeling about the quiet way programme, uh, and I, I came to this feeling last year, was that um, it should be cancelled. Um, that, that it's essentially a waste of money, um, that without any real political will in most of the boroughs, um, that we shouldn't, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't try to do things which, which can't be done. The money should instead be diverted to those handful of boroughs, the five or six, which have both the capability and the willingness to do things. Um, my, my feeling was that, the, that, we, um, that, that we should take a lesson from the, from the best practice in continental Europe and proceed mainly with routes on main roads. We should stop trying to do routes on side streets, which are obviously never going to happen to a, uh, a, a, a serious standard. We should stop trying to pretend um, that local councils want to do this, and we should just concentrate on the main roads where we have more control. Uh, and that's, that's what I'd have done if I'd, if I'd stayed in office. I would have cancelled the Quiet Ways programme, and I would have uh, reallocated the, the borough money to a handful of boroughs which actually want to do something serious, such as the Mini Holland boroughs, Camden, uh, you know, Hackney, a few others, and uh, and I would have I would have I would have put more effort into into building further routes on main roads. But is, isn't this partly as well about how the person in your role interacts with the boroughs, as in persuading and, and influencing well, people it, in the boroughs? It's it, if that's the test, then then clearly progress has you know been even more disappointing on the quiet ways since the election than before it, because, I mean, literally nothing has happened. Um, all, all the proposed improvements which we were proceeding with, the segregated track on South Lambeth Road, the bridge uh, at, um, at Hackney Wick, the so-called H10 bridge, the ramping of that, um, the filtering in Southwark, the filtering in Lambeth, the filtering in Croydon, all, all those have gone. Um, uh, but look, ultimately, we, we didn't have sort of plenipotentiary powers over the roads of of Lambeth and Croydon, we could only do as much as the as the you know councillors of Lambeth and Croydon were willing to let us do, um, and that turned out to be almost nothing, frankly. Um, it didn't take much to spook them, um, and uh, I mean, one sort of hopes. I mean, that, that the political sensitivity should probably have lessened um, in the last eighteen months or so. It's fairly clear that 
Labour's going to do pretty well in the, in the local elections um, coming up. They don't really need to worry about <coughs> losing control of councils, losing seats, losing votes, as much as they perhaps did in our time. But I, I haven't seen any great change in the willingness of the councils to do anything serious. Um, so we've seen an awful lot of, of you know, pictures of bicycles painted on roads, I'm afraid. Well, it's a shame we don't have London councils here to defend themselves, but anyway. Thank you. Um, now I'd look at outer London on camera. Thank you. Um, Andrew, the TfL identified that the Greater Outer London had the greatest potential for growth in cycling. It published an analysis in 2016 which showed that 55% of potential cycle trips were in the Outer London. That only 5% of potential cycle trips are in Outer London currently, compared to 9% in Inner London and 14% of Central London. Why did the last administration ignore Outer London? I think we um, put a, a lot of effort into Outer London, actually. Pardon? Um, we put a great deal of effort into Outer London. Um, the Mini Hollands programme, I think, as I said, has been really very successful. Uh, it's delivered really serious cycle infrastructure in two of the three boroughs. Kingston's not doing quite as well, but it's, it's, it's still delivered um, cycle infrastructure on the Portsmouth Road, for instance. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, it, it does show what you can do when you have a genuinely committed council in Enfield and Waltham Forest with a political leader who's prepared to take the flak and, and do something and, you know, ride through the flak until the, the sun lit up plans. And we are pretty much there um, in Walthamstow Village now. We've been through the flak. Um, nobody now would go back on what was done. Um, we are getting there in other parts of Waltham Forest. We're seeing a segregated track being installed on Leverage Road as we speak. We're seeing segregated tracks on the A105 in uh, Enfield, a scheme that had considerable public opposition but was pushed through by, you know, um, but it has got 60% support in the consultation and was pushed through by the, uh, by the determination of the council's political leadership there. Um, so I think, um, I mean, in as much as we are examining the last administration, which I don't suppose we are, I, I actually think we did rather a lot for cycling. In, in well, I mean, the analysis shows that these trips haven't gone up and out of London. And, of course, it sounds, listen to you, Andrew, that everything that went well was due to the last administration. What's ever gone bad is due to the boroughs, right? And that can't be right. Well, I think broadly, um, if you look at what was actually delivered... But I'm asking what was delivered right and out of London yeah. wasn't very good. No, I, 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 I disagree strongly with that. I think we're seeing some really spectacularly good schemes being delivered in outer London, in Waltham Forest so, and in Enfield, and to some extent in Kingston. And I think um, we had a, a whole series of... Um, we had a whole series of what we call better junctions as well, um, 33 of those, uh, and I think... Several of those were now to London, although they seem to have been deleted from the new were there, were there any lessons to be learned from the mini Hollands? I think uh, the, genuinely the lesson I take is that um, any meaningful scheme, any meaningful cycle scheme generates opposition. And, uh, um, and you have to take account of that opposition. You have to, you have to um, consult. You have to be consensual as you can. You have to change schemes where reasonable objections are raised. But... In the end, you do have to decide. You have to decide that this is better, this this is worth doing. Um, it, it will create a better place for everyone, and the opposition will go away, um, and people will realise that. And that is indeed what we've seen in, in Walthamstow, which is the earliest of the schemes. First of the mini Holland schemes in Walthamstow opened in 2015, um, and and we've been through that whole cycle. We've been through the cycle of big opposition demonstrations, court actions. Um, and then we've been through the cycle of implementation, and now we're in the cycle of acceptance and, and, and liking of the scheme. Um, and as I say, nobody, very few people in Walthamstow Village would now want to go back to the way it was before. Uh, and what do you think we need to do to increase the amount of cycling journeys in Louder London? I, I think we need to do the same things that have, done, have worked so well in inner London. I think we do need to build segregated routes. I think we need to make town centres more hospitable for cycling. Um, and there were a number of schemes which we, um, to which we allocated funds for. Um, we allocated funds for Ealing Town Centre, Twickenham Town Centre. Um, uh, we, allocated funds, uh, we allocated funds for Wimbledon, not just as part of the Mini Hollands. 
Um, again, those schemes seem to have disappeared from the radar. I'm not clear what's happened to those schemes. Um, but I hope um, that they can be revived. Well, I, I, mean, I, I don't know what's happened to them, but I, I, we certainly know there hasn't been any analysis done of what, what the impact of this were. This is just your comments, right? I know that TFL haven't done any critique of themselves, uh, well, uh, but I, I can understand the critique you've given of your own work. There's been, there's been, um, there's been an analysis of the impacts of, um, of the Mini Holland scheme in Walthamstow um, on buses, which was quite but, small. But who was done by it? By the council. Um, by the council. Uh, the there's been, haven't done any there's been analysis reason. of the impact of uh, there's been analysis of the impact on businesses in Waltham Stowe, which has again been very positive. Um, there's been analysis of the schemes that we delivered in central and inner London um, by TfL itself and by uh, um, just last week an independent panel of experts, um, and that's all very favourable. the The results of the of the superhighway build, for instance, have have seen a 55% increase in cyclists in the first six months alone, um, uh, significantly uh, uh, raised levels of cycling in central London generally. Um, cycling in central London has grown by far more than the trend percentage. No, I, 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 uh, so I understand all, all we don't, I, 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 I understand that the focus has been on in inner London. I, mean, I agree, accept that, and that's criticism making. Yeah. But all the focus has been on inner London, right? And not enough on the outer London, where well, the most potential was for cycle journeys. We, we were um, we, we were strongly focused on outer London. We had a whole series of programmes which I've described to you for, to to do that. Now some of those programmes have continued and have borne fruit, as I described. Others appear to have been abandoned by the new administration. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a couple of people have indicated. I've got uh, well, Caroline indicated earlier that she might want to come in on the section, and Navin and Joanne. Um, Given I'm doing the next section, shall I so come last? Yeah, and then please, OK. Uh, so we go, go to Navin and then Joe. Uh, yes, uh, representing uh, two out of London boroughs and uh, looking across uh, London, I, to be honest, don't see much uh, being done to promote cycling in out of London boroughs under your watch, OK? Mini Hollands were largely, purely dependent upon uh, uh, bidding rounds. If they are ones there that you say uh, were, were, were uh, the, the, the right uh, kind of uh, solution for uh, uh, promoting cycling uh, in Outland Baras, why were they left only for left to bidding rounds and not really actively promote them? Because there are most Baras who, who would welcome uh, a proper strategic approach to, to cycling initiatives. Why wasn't it done? All I can say, if, if we're examining the record of the past administration rather than the record of the current administration, as I thought, um, then all I can say is that we did allocate substantial amounts of money for any outer London borough that wanted to do anything ambitious. Um, and large amounts of money were given to those boroughs, not just the three Millie Holland boroughs, well, but to others. But those schemes seem to have vanished off the radar. Um, and I think the interesting question is... Um, you know, what's happening in the outer London now. Um, and what's happening in outer London now is really on a par with what's happening in inner and central London, which is not very much. No, but you see, a lot should have started. I disagree with your comment that monies were available. I know of my own, from my own experience, mm -hmm. where, where, where boroughs have uh, uh, bid or, or have uh, indicated that they, they wanted uh, mini halls, but uh, Obviously, the, the funds were not available. Now, given that outer London boroughs are and will be facing even more sort of unprecedented growth, round, round town central areas and, 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 and uh, uh, in, in other parts as well, because you've got uh, major uh, both opportunity areas, intensification mm -hmm. areas, etc., which will see huge amount of, uh, of both housing and uh, other sort of regeneration growth. Perfect opportunity to promote a, a need as well to, to promote cycling, okay? Uh, I mean, you, you heard uh, figures from uh, uh, Onkar uh, uh, as to, to what, what the situation is. So what is your message? What would you say needs doing, which should have started long ago, but that's past. Let's look at the future. What is the right approach uh, to promote uh, cycling to, to meet uh, 
with the growth projections? I think the mayor needs to go ahead um, with the schemes that we proposed in outer London centres such as Twickenham, Ealing, Wimbledon, um, Romford, uh, and uh, and I, I hope he does. And but ultimately, all those schemes depend not just on the willingness of the mayor, but on the willingness of the local council to countenance significant changes to the status quo on their roads, which bluntly is not always there. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, I've then got um, Joanne. I want to just pick up on some of the comments you made earlier about boroughs not having capacity. Um, when you were in charge, did you, at, TF, uh, at TFL, think about whether you could add extra capacity to boroughs? Or was it something you were thinking about that actually TFL should take more of a, a role and do more of that in-house and going into the boroughs themselves? I, I concluded by the end of the Quiet Way programme um, that we needed to take control of the Quiet Ways, really. Um, that the boroughs obviously have to give consent at every stage of the process to the um, to the uh, to, to what was happening on their roads, but I, I just didn't think they were capable of delivering it. A lot of them, and um, and I think, uh, but the, the essential problem wasn't capacity. The essential problem was really will. The essential problem was that most of the boroughs weren't willing to countenance any significant change to the status quo on their roads. Uh, and until that problem can be overcome, I, I, as I said to you before, I don't think there's much point in proceeding with the Quiet Waste programme. Okay. If I can ask about Millie Hollands, because I represent Enfield, mm. and I've now got a super duper cycle highway at the end of my road, which was very painful in its, <laughs> whilst it was being built. And just the length of time um, struck me that it's perhaps something that TfL should yeah. have more direct control because it seems to me that Enfield extremely willing, doing it very well with lots of opposition, um, but actually they are quite new yeah. for many councils. Yeah. Um, um, they're managing their own contractors, and, yeah. and that's quite a technical and difficult. So it's that it capacity is. in boroughs. I'm just asking yeah. you about whether. En Enfield's done really well, I think, on, on the yeah. Mini Hollands. They had they they probably had the slowest of the of the starts of the three Mini Holland boroughs. That's because there was more opposition in Enfield than anywhere else. Um, but once they decided to get a bit between their teeth, they were really good. And and um, and and you know they, they did it. And uh, I think um, we'll see the fruits of that. Obviously, it's only it hasn't been finished yet. I don't think yeah. entirely. Um, and only sections of it have been open, so it's still very new. So we're still at an earlier stage of the kind of like you know controversy, construction, acceptance curve that we've seen in Waltham Forest. But um, but once we get to the later stages of that, I'm sure we'll see what we saw in Waltham Forest. And um, uh, uh, and I, you know, I I you know strongly praise the council leadership, Daniel Anderson particularly, the the cabinet member, um, had to put up with a lot more flack over that than I did over anything I, I you know that. I, I was responsible for delivering directly. He's withstood it. And he has withstood it. Yeah. Um, but originally, you see, the Conservative um, opposition councillors as well signed they did. the pact and the joint they, bid. Yeah. But then, when then the opposition they, started, that's right. they, they quickly out. stopped. Did you, did you get the feeling that was for political reasons or for genuine I, concerns? I, I, I did feel. I mean, I, I mean, I had a lot of... Um, I had a... Um, a lot of conversations with a former Conservative MP for Enfield Southgate, David Burroughs, um, who obviously wanted to make an election issue out of this, didn't work for him. Uh, he lost his seat, um, and uh, and you know that's one of the that that's one of the things I find actually. I mean, again, you know, the the Labour MP for Walthamstow was re-elected with 80% of the vote, highest ever share of the vote. These things are popular. Um, that that the you know people want them. Um, if I remember that I remember the people on the A105 scheme, the objectors to the A105 saying it was only going to benefit one percent of the population. It was massively unpopular. Well, the consultation result came back sixty percent in favour. Now, if it had only benefited one percent of the population, the percentage of people in Enfield who cycled at that point, then it, it, it wouldn't have got that level of support. But people could recognise what it was doing for the whole neighbourhood, how it was lifting the whole neighbourhood, and how it was making the whole neighbourhood better for everyone um, who, who who went there. And um, and I think, you know, I, I I think the lessons for me from uh, from the Mini Holland experience in Enfield, our experience in um, in Central and Inner London, 
um, is that you shouldn't be afraid. These things are popular and you should do them. Yeah. But they're painful while they're happening. They're painful while they're happening, but, but you know, they're not yeah, vote losers. So. They're not yeah. vote losers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, move to Caroline. Yes, um, just picking up on outer London, um, just for the record, the spending um, uh, was significantly more in inner London than outer London, but I'm not going to beat you up about that. Um, it was 74 million in inner and 18 on the mini Hollands and 9 million spent between the two. Um, just picking up while we're still on outer London and this issue of the, um, of, of the opposition, if you were kind of doing all this again, you know, seeing the opposition that the new mayor is experiencing with, um, in, out in Chiswick, mm -hmm. with people literally praying um, not to have a cycle superhighway, do you think that there is something that could be done differently about the messaging about these kind of changes to our streets that you would do differently if you were kind of um, in the position you were in now. I think I think at the beginning that the new administration did suggest there was something you know there was something wrong with the messenger we we had which is why we had the opposition we did but I think they've come to realise they must have come to realise with Chiswick um, that that actually the opposition is generated by meaningful change um, it's not it's not it's ultimately what you do it's not how you sell it um, that that creates the opposition I mean you could you could call it anything you wanted you could sell it. In, in, you could sugarcoat it as much as you want it, but there will always be people who will be against removing road space from cars and giving it to pedestrians and cyclists, um, however you dress it up. Um, and, and, and I think we did, as I said, I think we, you know, we, we did quite well to overcome some of the opposition that we had, and we had a whole series of techniques which in retrospect seemed to work quite well. Um, Such we as? Did, we did... Um, we, we enlisted lots of businesses, for instance, to support the east, west, and north, south superhighways. So whenever anyone, you know, whenever uh, somebody produced a business um, to oppose it, we produced three or four to support it. That was done uh, as much by an independent group called Cycling Works as us. And, you know, fantastic work they did. Um, we commissioned an opinion poll to, uh, you know, professional opinion poll by YouGov to show that they were popular. That took a lot of the wind out of the opposition sales. Um, we we did um, consult very extensively. We had a roughly two-year period of sort of consultations with stakeholders, with the local authorities and um, the Royal Parks and people like that, followed by um, uh, a ten-and-a-half-week public consultation, which is actually significantly longer. It's almost double the length of the public consultation they've had on CS9, for instance. Um, so if anything, the new administration has been less consultative than we were on controversial schemes. Um, and, uh, and we did, after the consultation, we did take account of, you know, reasonable objections. Um, so, for instance, some people objected that the delays induced by the scheme on the highway coming in to Tower Hill in the morning were too great. We agreed with that and we changed the scheme to reduce those delays. Um, so, we, I, you know, I, I think in the end the proof of the pudding is in the delivery. Um, and we did deliver quite a large number of quite good schemes uh, and I think I think the new administration's got to realise that there is no way of making meaningful change to the status quo on the roads, there is no way of making that acceptable to everyone um, it will nearly always, as, as we found have significant majority support but it will never have unanimous support and it will never be unopposed, opposition is not something to be feared it is, it is, um, it is you know, it, it is absolutely inevitable um, and uh, and I think you know there are whole ways, a series of ways you can overcome it. We did a couple of other things to just recap very quickly on what we did. We we looked at the schemes in a very very granular way. So for instance, um, we looked at whether when, when when we had to remove parking on the road itself, we looked at whether we could reprovide it around the corner. Um, we looked at how buses would work when there was going to be a delay for buses caused by that particular scheme. We looked at what we could do further down the route to to mitigate that. You know, mm -hmm. put in a a new bus lane or something to, to speed it up there even if it slowed down um, uh, um, where it hit the superhighway, that kind of thing. So we did a huge amount of really quite granular work looking in detail at objections which were raised on, on every scheme and that, and that again helped us achieve what we achieved which was you know, quite substantial I think. 
And do you think TF do you think there's anything that the current administration should be doing to get TFL moving faster, or do you think it is political delay? I, I, I think ultimately you have you have to have a mayor who believes in cycling, who wants to do it. And I just I don't see any evidence the current mayor really does. I think he wants he wants to talk about it, he doesn't want to do it. Um, he doesn't want to make any kind of decisions that might upset anybody. Um, so we've seen that the, 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 the CS11 um, is, 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 the, is the classic case in point. That went out to consultation in February and March 2016, um, closed on the 20th of March 2016, 21 months ago nearly. Um, it, uh, it, uh, it came back with 60% support in the consultation, but it was um, strongly opposed by a campaign which, as the consultation shows, represented only a fairly small number of people. Um, since that time, for the whole of the 21 months, the mayor's declined to make a decision on, on mm -hmm. you know, even some relatively modest things. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically, it consists of a gyratory scheme, which I think he has approved, a Swiss cottage, and then closing some gates into Regent's Park to stop it being a rat run for traffic. And that's, that's pretty much all. And a couple of bits of segregation mm -hmm. at Portland Place, that's pretty much all. But we still have make decisions. <coughs> make decisions, just get on and do it. Um, and, and, you know, the slogan of the Cycling and Walking Commissioner's previous employer was just do it. Um, and that really is, you know, you know, make the case by doing. That's, that's what Jeanette Sadiq Khan, Cycling, the Transport Commissioner in New York, also said. Make the case by doing and you will show, the more you build these things, the more you will show that the objections are unfounded and they are unequivocally good things for London. OK, I'm going to move us on to targets because that's one way that we can um, uh, drive change forward. Um, the Mayor's transport strategy um, obviously is emphasising a healthy streets approach um, and um, that's about um, making sure that um, you know, there's, a, there's a whole checklist that they go through and what's interesting in that is that there are critical issues which are safety issues which a scheme cannot pass the healthy streets check unless they pass those critical safety issues. So that, that seems like a positive thing. It's also um, taking on board the needs of pedestrians as well as cyclists, whereas the previous checklists for, were entirely around cycling. Um, the, the mayor has an actual, well, he's got there's several targets. There's one which is that he wants 80% of journeys to be made by walking, cycling, and public transport by 2041, um, which is pretty ambitious. There's going to have to be a lot of people getting out of their cars, a lot more people cycling, and a lot more people using public transport and walking and doing each of those three different activities. So how helpful do you think the mayor's proposed target of 70% of people living within 400 metres of a safe, high-quality cycle route by 2041 is... Um, almost entirely unhelpful. I, I mean, I, I mean, it's so far away. It's, it's you know, he, he, he can't be held to account for that. Um, he's not going to be mayor in 2041. Um, I think, I think, if you are going to set targets, and on the whole, we we didn't in fact set targets, but if you are going to set targets, they should be crunchy targets that you can achieve and be held accountable for during your mayoralty. Um, if I if I was to set a target, I would say. I mean, actually, the mayor did set a target in his election manifesto. He promised to treble the length of segregated lanes. Um, that is to 36 miles. We built 12 miles. Um, now, that, that seems like a target that he might have some chance or he might have had some chance of meeting. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, you know, and that's what he said before the election. Um, uh, uh, so if you're going to set targets, set, set really quite specific targets that you can do in your own time. I mean, you know, promising something in 2041 is like Clem Attlee or something turning up having won the 1945 election and saying, I'm definitely going to give you the National Health Service by 1970. Uh, just get on and do it. Mm -hmm. What about um, mode share targets? So do you think there should be targets around how many people are cycling, how many people are walking? On the whole, no. Um, I... I mean, I, I think, I, I, um, I, again, we didn't have a mode share target because um, I thought it was inevitably a bit arbitrary. How do you arrive at it? Why, you know, do you, what, 4%, 5%, why 4%, why not 45 why not 5 There's also a moving target given how the mode, you know, the, the, the use of other modes is increasing. Um, 
I, I, I would not have a moat chair target. Um, I, as I said, I, I would have a, a target saying build X amount by year X, uh, preferably, you know, I mean, I, I, I think they're, getting, they're running out of time to build anything by the end of this term, but, you know, maybe if he's re-elected, build X amount by 2024. I mean, that, that works for linear routes, and linear routes are really useful and yeah. important, in particular the ones that go right out into outer London. Um, but for something like Mini Holland, which is absolutely transformatory on an area-wide level, that doesn't really fit with a build X metres of cycle lane per but you year can do. You could, you could, for instance, say, you know, we will filter X number of roads or we will make <coughs> X number of shopping areas better or we will, you know, mm -hmm. we, will, we, will, we, will, we will see X new businesses open, you know, X new retail businesses open thanks to this. We will see... Yeah, you can if you want have a. I mean, in a in a much smaller area like a, a borough, it might be possible to come up with a numerical target. We will see X thousand people walking and cycling, more people walking and cycling by year X. But but the years need to be soon. The years need to be within a, a, a term, term for which you can be held accountable. Um, anything with a a time scale of you know, sort of what is it, thirty thirty years nearly. Um, 20 something. 20, 27, 20, 24 years, isn't it? 24 years. Um, anything with a time scale of 24 years in the future is worthless. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So, finally, cycling parking, Joanne? Yeah, well, I want to ask you about cycle parking. Mm -hmm. I mean, under this committee, I did a report about eight years ago, um, and I found that um, obviously the safety of cycling on the roads was an issue as a barrier to yeah. people, but actually having somewhere secure to park and secure your cycle was one of the major barriers as well. Um, from your time, can you say how you think TfL, whether they're good or not at forecasting, addressing the need for cycle parking in London? <coughs> we, we had a programme to deliver 80,000 cycle parking spaces, and I think we delivered about 74,000, so we succeeded in that. My concern was still, I, I didn't, you know, I, I still had some concerns with that, um, were they being delivered in the right places? And, and you will often see, again, this is you know, mostly down to the boroughs, it's their streets, it has to be done on. They have to agree where, the, where to put this new parking. But, um, uh, I mean, you do often see cycle stands put in places where nobody's using them. Um, and uh, I, if anyone knows cycles, Cycle Quiet Way 1, um, there's a sort of bit by South Bermondsey Station where three or four cycle stands have been plonked in the middle of a path, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, <laughs> next to absolutely nothing. Every time I cycle, I've never seen a single bike ever attached to any of those stands um, any time I've cycled past, but nonetheless they no doubt fulfil some bureaucrat's quota of, you know, they, they go towards our 80,000 cycle parking spaces. So there's a, there's a severe shortage of cycle parking spaces still in, um, in the West End um, and uh, at, at railway stations, and, uh, and I think that's something that needed to be address um, and I hope the new Crossrail stations will have adequate cycle parking. We certainly did quite a lot of work with Crossrail to make sure that's the case obviously I, I, you know, I'm not across where that's got to now. Um, I mean I don't know whether you have but in the just recently published London plan the Mayor set out mm. minimum s space standards for cycle parking which look parking pretty Parking development yeah. No ambitious. they're pretty good yeah. No, I'm, 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 I'm you know I think that's that's uh, you know that and CS9 are roughly the only good things he's done, <laughs> but I think there's a, but I, I, you know, that there is a, uh, I just hope it's delivered. Um, and and again, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's important, but but um, but I, I do think having parking somewhere, you know, to have somewhere to park where you live, um, but having somewhere to park where you go at the other end is important as well. Yeah, I mean, um, and I think looking at the London plan. Um, they do seem to be very specific on business um, or leisure use as to how many spaces you can have. And of course, if the London plans there, local authorities would have to be in conformity with that. So that's, quite, I think, quite a step mm. um, forward. But can I ask, what lessons did you learn about um, cycle parking in people's homes? Because that's not another thing that my report highlighted, actually, that particularly local authorities and states, when we're talking about increasing density of living in London, mm. the chance that people have front or back gardens to yeah. keep cycles and cycle lockers, how you can 
purpose built developments to cater for this. That's right. Lo lots of people haven't got room to put keep their bikes at home anymore because their homes are smaller and their homes are more crowded. Um, so uh, and we recognise that and we funded councils to to do cycle lockers, which you do see proliferating now on the streets, and I see them everywhere now. Um, and uh, and again, I think that was a th that's part of our eighty thousand bases, and I think that was a success of. Of our, of our policy and, and I think that's that is something that councils can actually do quite easily um, although even there sometimes they're reluctant to take away even single parking spaces but but you know but on the whole they can kind of scrunch up their courage to do that much I mean obviously the mayor controls TfL stations um, so he has some direct control as yeah. to what happens in those car parks or in immediate yeah. locations but can I ask with national rail did you find that they were willing to look at cycle parking or did they look at it as taking not, away car? No, not, not specially. I yeah. mean, I, we had the common experience of everyone who has any dealings with the railways. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, they're not, they're, they're, it's, there's something in the railway DNA that, mm. that, that requires to make simple things complicated. So we spent literally years talking to them about using completely unused space under Waterloo Station for a massive uh, yeah. cycle hub. Which would have been brilliant because you could, you know, there's, there's nothing going on under Waterloo Station. It used to be the Eurostar catering area, but it, has a, it's, it hasn't been the Eurostar catering area for about 20 years. Um, and uh, I took a walk around with a you know, helpful gentleman in a hard hat, and there's enormous amounts of space which isn't being touched. But we had endless meetings, endless discussions, never got anywhere. Uh, and that so was typical of our interactions with Network Rail and the railways generally. So that's an area that the mayor needs to. It's really For an sure, area. It's yes. it's an area. You know, it could be a relatively quick win, yeah. um, but but it's you know involves the railways where nothing is quick. Okay, fine. And can I ask, are you aware of any good practice from other UK or international cities about cycle parking that we should be looking at here? Um, there's a. I, I'm doing a report for um, the National Infrastructure Commission on Oxford and Cambridge, and uh, Cambridge's got a rather um, excellent uh, cycle parking facility at its station. Um, the largest in the UK, it's almost Dutch. Um, it's multi-storey. It's basically a multi-storey car park for bikes, um, and it's really good. We could probably do with a few of those here. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I had a, a long discussion. I remember with um, Network Rail and Bexley Council about um, creating something similar on a slightly smaller scale, but similar at Abbey Wood, um, to serve the Crossrail station there and to allow people who lived in Thamesmead to cycle to the station instead of having to wait for a bus. Um, and uh, I mean, anyone's been, to, you know, it, Thames has actually got quite a good network of cycle paths. Paradoxically, it was built, you know, if, if you go there and cycle around, it's actually quite good internally. Um, it's a bit more difficult to get across the uh, the manor way to get to the station. But you know, those things could have been fixed. And and again, little or no progress is made on that. I'm afraid it, it came across the usual railway problems. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Uh, thank you. We appreciate your time. <coughs> I'll send you a list of the um, schemes which should have happened and haven't, if I may. That's yeah, that would be, be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any, uh, just before we go... the report on Oxford and Cambridge would be useful as Yes, well. if we yeah, could have that, yeah. That yeah, yeah, pretty soon. It's yeah, been done. Sharing that, being, we'd be very yeah, grateful. It's just being shared with all the stakeholders this week. So. Yeah. Thank you. Well thank done. you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, just one final issue for us. Uh, is any other business? Any other business? Yeah. Right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, at least you don't know you're leaving, anyway. GLA Chamber Sound.